Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming and listen, I welcome all of you in attendance today. I greatly appreciate it. All of you in this audience, everybody that's watching online, we greatly appreciate that you're here. Thank you for attending our 40th program of this year. Thank you. We still have another four programs that are published and a fifth program that I just found out about, but that's what we have ending for this year at approximately 45 programs. In addition to that, we've now done over 190 programs since we first did our first one in February of 2010. Another great accomplishment because what we are doing is we are providing education for all those affected by multiple sclerosis. For those that do not know who I am, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and yes, I too have MS, which is what propelled me to do everything that I am doing these days for everybody here. And MS Views and News, well, what do we do? We provide educational opportunities and educational information for everybody affected by MS. So thank you again. You know, recently we were proved to be members of the MS Coalition. For those that don't know what the MS Coalition is, it's a body of the largest seven or eight organizations, MS organizations that are out there, and they just want to expand their membership. And they named MS Views and News as their first expansion. So this is great for us, this is great for everybody in the world that knows who we are and will know more about the MS Coalition because they're going to have me part of their strategic planning committee as well. It's a good thing. For those that might have been handed an awards dinner card when you came into in here, we're going to be doing our first awards dinner in April. Okay, we hope that to see all of you at this program. We are not making it too much for you to be there. So we do hope that you will be there and we'll be honoring Dr. Brian Steingo and we'll also be honoring a former NFL football player for the Miami Dolphins who was a first round draft pick out of the Alabama Crimson Tide, for those that know this. His name is Don McNeil and Don McNeil also has MS and the topic or the name of the program will be Champions Tackling MS. Good name for the football player and for Dr. Brian Steingo. All right, before I get into too much more babble, I want to thank those that belong given thanks today. And we have, first, Genzyme, a Santa Fe company. And I would like everybody to thank them because we cannot do this program today without them. <laughs> MS Fuse and News relies on the pharmaceutical industry to give us grants to provide these educational programs. And that's why we like to thank those that deserve being given thanks. In addition to Genzyme, a Santa Fe company, for today's program, we also have to have a neuroscience. And I hope you all like that as well. Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals. And we have Genentech. And Genentech you'll hear a little about later on as well. You do not know presently about a medication for them, but they too will have a medication hopefully in the near future. But Genzyme, for those that don't know, they are the makers of Abagio and Lemtrada. Teva Neuroscience has Copaxone. Mallinckrodt has the Akthar gel for MS relapse. And Genentech, again, it's a medication that I can't give you the name of yet, but you'll hear about from one of the speakers. Okay, so the next step, who else has to be thanked? Well, we have all of our exhibitors are out there. We'd like to thank them all for being here. Our volunteers, the board members, the staff of MS Views and News, and most of all, who do I want to thank is all of you. Because without you, everybody give a round of applause for yourselves and those that are online. Thank you very much, because this means nothing unless you are here. Who has seen or heard about our learning channel on YouTube, anybody? Great, I'm glad to see some hands up. So we have this learning channel on YouTube that's accessible from the website. So we have the learning channel on YouTube and on there we have over 180 videos about anything that you wanna know about multiple sclerosis, it's there. If you wanna catch up on something that maybe you were at attendance of one of our programs in the past, then great. If you weren't, then if you just use the search, you'll be able to find the topics. If you have any colleagues, friends, family, or otherwise that you want them also to know about multiple sclerosis, well, this would be the chance and this would be the place for them to learn from. So we hope that you do use this. In addition, this year, we started a free community service for all in the state of Florida, and that's our social worker program. It is a free community service for anybody that needs resources, needs help with financial assistance, with different things that cost dollars, with home 
health with, with, with just about everything that relates to your multiple sclerosis. And it's not just for the patient, but it's also for the caregivers. So if anybody needs this, this is a free service by MS Views and News. And we're currently offering it for everybody in the state of Florida and for everybody that's outside the state of Florida. Our social workers here are now able to refer you to social workers in your states. So that way you can get the free services from those in your state. So you'll be able to do that as well. All right, so next, I'm supposed to smile. Hi, I'm smiling. I have a note here to smile, you believe that? Okay, I had to write my own notes, but I had to include that too. So I already spoke to you about the format for today. And I think I told you, Dr. Ramahan first, and then we have Dr. Burks. You all have, you have agendas on your table if you wanna see who's speaking what. There's only two agendas, I believe, per table. See who's doing what, when, where, and how, and then we're gonna get ready to begin. I think Dr. Ramahan might be in the room. Is he somewhere here? Oh, he's down here, great. Okay, so, all on the webcast, by the way. Everybody that's on the webcast that's watching this, if you have any questions during the Q&A, I need you to text me your questions. Yes, I get to give you my phone number. <laughs> Only use it for this program. It's 954-684-1683. If you have any questions that you want us to bring up to the to the, to the, not to the pharmaceuticals, to the physicians that are here today, please send a text to that number. Again, it's 954-684-1683. Thank you. All right, let's begin. Dr. Ramahan, thank you. Thank you, thank you. You can give me a hug, yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. Okay, there you go. 35. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm glad there is a really good turnout. Considering how it is outside, this is probably a better place to be. And I hope you leave here uh, a little richer with regards to the knowledge of what MS is all about. And uh, Stuart has really put together a great program and uh, three of us will be speaking to you this morning. And there is gonna be a significant amount of time allocated for Q&A. And if you are not able to get your questions through, I'll be happy to be hanging around to talk to you. So. I believe that the best patient with MS is the one who's most informed about the disease. It's very, very important that you have a good understanding of what this disease is all about and not be worried and scared about it, but to understand this better and that actually makes you deal with the situation better. So even though the title of my talk says immunology of uh, MS, I would be doing you a disfavor if I just talked about immunology because this disease is much, much more than immunology. It involves neurobiology. How does the brain react to the insults uh, that uh, is put on the brain by the immune system? And how does it react with regards to uh, inflammation? How does it react with uh, repair? And a lot of this information is only coming in. And as we go along, we are learning more and more. And even clinical trials that fail teach us a lot about this disease. So what I'll try to do is give you an overview. And uh, I'm sure I'm talking to a mixed group of people in terms of your knowledge of MS. There are some of you who are very, very knowledgeable and uh, others who are just getting started with understanding what this disease is all about. So uh, you may hear some of the things that you already know about, but I hope uh, that uh, you know, repetition is not necessarily bad and it actually, you get something more out of it when, when this whole thing, uh, when we finish talking about this. So I hope you can all see the slides. Uh, the first slide uh, is someone who was unfortunate enough to have the disease and died with this disease. And this is what the brain looks like at autopsy. And I use the word died with the disease because not necessarily is this disorder fatal. Uh, often someone dies of other causes, uh, heart attacks, strokes, uh, uh, cancers, uh, the usual causes that uh, we all go by. But MS can sometimes be fatal, but uh, it's not uh, usually the cause of death in, in most instances. 
And, and what you see here are a bunch of arrows. And um, this is what uh, uh, Charcot, who described this disorder, described over 100 years ago. And basically what he saw were these lesions that uh, are just around the uh, cortex, and then the lesions that are present around the chambers of the brain. This is the classic location where you see the lesions. And fortunately, today we can actually look at these lesions by magnetic resonance imaging. And the important thing to keep in mind is that these lesions uh, are scars where inflammation occurred and a variety of different things occurred. And out in the periphery, where, which is the cortex, which is called the gray matter of the brain, are the nerve cells. And what you have in the white matter are the nerve fibers that are covered by myelin. And what he described was loss of myelin without loss of axon. And he said axonal loss when it occurs is a late thing. And that's one part about this disease that he was wrong about. It is an early phenomenon. And the main thing that I want, to, want you to take home about this is that <clears throat> MS is much more than a disorder of myelin. It's a disorder of axons as well as a disorder of neurons. And I'll come back to this in many form and fashion as we keep going through this uh, description. So what we have here is uh, a few points about this disease. It's a disorder that is acquired. Very important to remember that nobody is born with multiple sclerosis. But the tendency to get the disease can be inherited. There is a genetic basis for this, and we'll be coming to it a little. We'll be just touching on it. There is a, there is a very big genetic study that is going on worldwide called the IMSGC, International MS Genetics Consortium. University of Miami is a very big part of that. <clears throat> and uh, what, what you have to remember is everybody is born normal. And for reasons that we still are trying to figure out, there is something that happens in the environment combined with something that happens in the genetics of the individual that results in uh, occurrence of this disease. And I will give you my personal bias about what the environmental factors are in a few minutes. The, this is one of the most common disorders that affects young people in this country, the most common cause of disability in the, in the young, next to automobile accidents. There are 70 per 100,000 if you look at the numbers across uh, the US, but we really, really don't know what the final number is because a lot of these figures come from the old literature. And with the advancements that have been made, the diagnosis that occur early, the numbers may actually be larger. But the very important part about this slide is that there is a north-south predilection within the United States. The 37th parallel runs through um, Denver, Roanoke, in Virginia, and San Francisco. So you see the 40th line here, north of it is the United States and Canada. A lot more MS than what you see south. And of course, Florida is in the less involved area. And this is very striking when you go to a place like Minneapolis, Minnesota, where you see the number of MS patients that you have is far more. In fact, when you go to Vermont, you will see every McDonald has a little uh, in a fundraiser for multiple sclerosis. And the, the, the incidence of MS per capita is considerably higher than what it is in, the, in, in this part of the country. That's not to say we don't have MS. We thought at one time it was much less, but it's really not true. There are a lot of patients, but still much less per capita than what you see around the Great Lakes and, and the northern part of the United States. This map of the world is really important because <clears throat> there are a number of arrows that go from the region of the British Isles and, and, uh, and, and, and the Scandinavian countries. And, and one of those lines that go um, into Faroe Islands is really a place where a mess occurred and then disappeared. And we really have no idea why that is the case. The genetics of that population is the same as what you have in Finland. There are, lots of, there are lots of cases of MS in Finland, but not in the Faroe Islands. And that's something that is still true, and we are still trying to figure out what that is due to. The arrow for South Africa is very important um, because this is where the first epidemiological study was done, and the person who did the study, Dr. Dean from Ireland, uh, really was not looking to show a change uh, with regards to MS, but that turned out to be the biggest finding. He was actually studying a disorder more common there called porphyria variegata, and MS was a control group, and the control group information turned out to be more inform informative, and that's how the difference in the geography of MS was discovered. 
And many, many studies since then have confirmed this fact. And there are a lot of theories about it, but if I were to summarize what I personally would think about it, there is an environmental factor combined with genetics. And what is that environmental factor? I'm a big proponent of the fact that it is probably a virus. And that view is not necessarily always shared by everybody in the field. The virus that is being looked at is Epstein-Barr virus. A number of you have heard about it, infectious mononucleosis. And there are major differences. Epstein-Barr virus is a virus that is seen worldwide, but MS is not worldwide. And, and part of the reason is the type of Epstein-Barr virus in this part of the world is very different from the part, uh, the, the type of virus in the rest of the rest of the world. So there, there is a lot of good information on that that we can talk about during the Q&A, but uh, this does look very promising. And what that means is that if we can successfully produce a vaccine for EB virus and prevent mononucleosis and other forms of uh, Epstein-Barr, we might be able to eradicate this disease. And that's a very important part of it. So that map uh, brought up this concept that vitamin D may be the reason why there is more or less MS in different parts of the world. And what you really have is an observation that was made um, that we were probably right for the wrong reason, because I really don't believe that it's the vitamin D deficiency that decides the presence or absence of MS in tropical versus subtropical and temperate. I think uh, it, uh, I, as I mentioned, I think it's a virus, but people started looking at vitamin D, and there are a lot of factors that suggest that keeping your vitamin D level in the normal range is probably a good thing. There's, there's a lot of information that shows that vitamin D has a, a significant effect on the immune system. And keeping vitamin D levels in the normal range is a very important thing. And this is something that we check in our patients. And we recommend supplementation if your levels are low. How precisely vitamin D acts on the immune system to cause uh, its effect is really a mystery. And there are differences in gender. There are the, 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 it, it, this may be particularly important in female versus males because vitamin D metabolism in the liver is significantly different in females versus males. So it is a much more complex situation than what it would uh, suggest. But that is the story about vitamin D. I'm not going to get into it uh, a lot more. I'm going to give you just two more slides about the environmental causes, and this is related to the virus. And this is a study that was done by Brenda Banwell and her group uh, when she was in Toronto. And, and essentially what she did is she looked at pediatric MS patients who were less than 13 years of age, not to prove anything about Epstein-Barr virus, but she looked at serology, what were the children exposed to, uh, compared to control patients, one to three. For every one patient, she looked at three controls. And the one thing that stood out is that Epstein-Barr virus is significantly higher in its titer, or rather, number of people who are affected is significantly more for Epstein-Barr virus in the MS population compared to the controls. So the study was not aimed at looking at EBV, but it turned out showing that it was EBV. And this study, which is equally important, is also not there to show that EBV is the reason why we have MS. This is a group uh, from Germany that actually looked at random peptides, in other words, random proteins, four amino acids. And these proteins were tested against the serum and spinal fluid. And they found this one particular protein called B3. And this is the housekeeping genes that really are not uh, affected. And you can see the significant titer. And of course, in the spinal fluid, they were reacting. And when they looked at what could the sequence point to, it was a protein from the Epstein-Barr virus. So once again, not going in there with the idea that it's Epstein-Barr virus, but still finding Epstein-Barr virus to be the cause. And I really do believe that of all the different viruses, uh, this is probably one of the most important viruses that may give us some clue. Now, with regards to genetics, this is something that we get asked all the time. You know, I have MS. What are the chances that my child <coughs> could have MS? It's a very common, concerned parent question. We do know that there is a significant involvement of genetics in the genesis of MS, in the expression of MS, in the response of the individual to treatment in terms of uh, the ultimate uh, disability. All of these factors 
are affected by genetics. And it's not a single gene that causes it, but a group of genes, much like what you see in diabetes. Inheritance is also very similar to what one sees in diabetes. If your parents have the diabetic propensity, the chances that you will get it is higher. But that doesn't mean every child born to a diabetic parent is going to have MS. In fact, 98 children born to MS parents don't get MS. It is, it is two out of the 100 that will get MS. And that too is, a, is, is significantly different than the rest of the population. What this shows is if you look at the same region where somebody was born and raised, what you find is that in the Caucasian, the incidence is highest, African American next, Asians next, and Native Americans almost unknown. So in the true Native American population, the disease seems to be extremely rare unless other genes are involved, namely Asian genes or Caucasian genes. So this is essentially a Caucasian gene, and of course the Scandinavian countries are credited with this. And uh, we talk about the migration of the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths and uh, the Vikings that moved this gene across the, across the, across the world. So in terms of what is important about this is it is not enough to study the Caucasian gene to get the answer for genetics. In fact, some of the best information has come from studying the African American, and I will give you an example of that. And we are studying the Hispanic in this region, and there are Caucasian genes and Asian genes in the Hispanic. And, um, and in the South American country, the Hispanics have also some Native American or Native Indian uh, blood. So why is it important? And I'll show you just this one example. And this is what they found when they looked at the African American population. We have known for a long time that sometimes, not always, but sometimes the disease can be extremely malignant in the African American population. We never understood why, but sometimes that's the case. And if somebody comes with us, uh, even in the early stages, with really no disability at all, but MRI that suggests very active disease, most of us would go to an extremely aggressive treatment rather than start with something that is traditionally low effective but safe to more effective but with side effects. And this is a study that showed that when you studied the African American people, there are two genes that are linked in the Caucasian that becomes unlinked in the African American. And what you find is that when you unlink one gene from the other, one gene can be extremely virulent because there is not the other gene to modulate and modify the disease. So in the Caucasian American, A allele and B allele both produce a more moderate disease, but when you inherit just the B without the A as it is in the African American, it can be a fatal disorder at a very young age. So what they did in this experiment is to take those genes and put it into mice, what are called humanized mice, and they could show that when you put A, there was no disease. When you put B, the, all the mice died from a fulminant brain demyelination. When you put A plus B, you get this pattern of relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, something that we are all accustomed to. So even though A by itself looked pretty harmless, it is not because it is taking part in the expression of the disease. Normally you would have say, said A has no role to play, but it does because it does modify B in a manner that causes the expression that we see in the Caucasian. So this is very important and such dissociations can be studied in the other uh, uh, group than Caucasians and I think it's important to do this and if, uh, if any of you have not contributed uh, your blood for studying MS. It's a one-time blood draw, and I saw Patricia sitting outside. She has a table there. You, she can give you information. Uh, is she here, Patricia, anyway? So, uh, so we can actually, uh, you know, you can contribute to that by giving blood. So now I'm going to move on to the MRI, and uh, this is something that you're all familiar with. This is probably the greatest advancement that has occurred in multiple sclerosis and understanding, because now you can actually see those lesions I showed that we used to see at autopsy, but now we can actually see it during life. And what you see here are these large lesions in an individual who has had the disease for no more than five years, and, and some of them are enhancing, and yet 
the individual is 100% normal by the best neurologists with the best examination. We are unable to find anything. And the explanation that we said was, well, if it occurred in an eloquent area, he would have had problems. And of course, there is no more eloquent part of the brain than the spinal cord, which is the size of your thumb. And if you have a lesion, as you see, there are sizable lesions that occupy almost the entire spinal cord uh, in a longitudinal fashion, multiple areas, skip lesions. These, this individual, you would expect, if you looked at the MRI, to have problems, but yet EDSS of zero, which means that you cannot even find an abnormality, leave alone the patient experience any abnormality. And this is a paradox that we have known forever, and the FDA will not allow MRI to be an endpoint in any phase three clinical trial as a primary endpoint. In other words, you cannot decide whether the drug is working or not working just on the basis of an MRI. So, and I think that's, that's an important uh, uh, point. Not all of my colleagues ag agree with me either on that. There are some who feel that you should use MRI as an endpoint. And in fact, at the Ectrams, there was a, an argument for and against should the FDA and the regulatory agencies approve on the basis of MRI. And it's interesting. And uh, the, the consensus was in a drug that's already approved for MS in a population where you're testing to see if it is working or not, MRI should be sufficient as a surrogate. And that population was the pediatric MS. So basically, most people agreed it shouldn't be the primary endpoint for the regular clinical trials. But in pediatric MS, if you want to do it and show an effect and have a drug released early, one could do a trial using MRI. But MRI is one of the greatest advancements that has been made. Now, let, why is this paradox? And this paradox is because, as I mentioned before, in MS, there are three things that are happening. And this is one of the things. And this is where Charcot was wrong. He said, axons are cut, but cut late. Bruce Trapp from the Cleveland Clinic showed, no, that's not the case. As many as 11,000 axons are severed uh, in an acute lesion. And once an axon is severed, it does not grow back. So it's a one-way street. And it's something that causes permanent disability if that axon was important in doing some function that uh, you associate uh, with a certain area of the brain. So basically, these large green bulbs uh, are cut axons. And, and, and basically, he showed that uh, this was something that uh, occurred very early. And what is interesting is uh, Doinikov, who was a contemporary of Charcot, over 100 years ago showed the same phenomenon. Nobody believed him. So Charcot was very powerful, and his views prevailed. And that happens even today. And this is an example of cortical lesions. Again, something that Charcot did not appreciate. I don't think I'm quite be able to point out. But what you see here is the gray matter that's in light, bl light brown, and the dark blackish area is the myelin. And you can actually see the, the lesions that are in the myelin. And what's interesting is there are also lesions that are in the cortex. <clears throat> and the cortex is where the nurse cell body is. So the important thing, and this is again a larger blow up showing lesions in the cortex. So the one thing that I want you to take home from this is that MS is not just a disorder of myelin. It affects the cerebral cortex, as I showed you, where you, have the, where you have the nerve cells, and the white matter, where you have the axons, which are the cable, and myelin, which is the insulation. The important thing is, of the three things, the most important, or the least important, is myelin, and the most important is the axon and the neuron. And MRI is great to detect myelin loss. It is lousy in being able to detect axonal loss and neuronal loss. Because today, we have to do some special studies with the MRI to be able to show loss of axons, rather than uh, uh, it's not part of the routine I investigation. We see what we, what we call black holes. But a black hole is sort of like after a house is burned down and you have ashes, and you say, oh, there was a house here. You really want to be able to see something much, much earlier. And MRI does not reflect that. Now, remyelination. I mean, there, are, there is a huge effort in understanding return of myelin. And, and return of myelin is poor in the central nervous system. So when somebody develops an acute attack of optic neuritis and has lost vision, and lost vision to the point that uh, you are not even able to see light, 
Amazingly, vision returns in MS almost 100% to the point that 15 years later when you're asked which eye was affected, you sometimes have trouble remembering. And what is interesting, as I will show you, is that optic nerve still has no myelin. So loss of myelin is not equal to loss of function. A very important reason why you cannot look at an MRI and say this individual must be paralyzed, this individual must be blind, and you cannot do that simply because of this dichotomy that we've been talking about. So what you see here is what is called as shadow plaques, and up here, somewhere here, you can see light blue area of plaques, and then you have these very stark white areas. These are areas that are remyelinated, here is another one, and this area is totally demyelinated. So the point is, there is some remyelination that occurs, and remyelination is not the reason why return of function occurs, because remyelination is so little. And there's a huge push to see if we can remyelinate in the brain. And if we can, what it does is it protects the axon that is naked otherwise and susceptible to injury. So if we can remyelinate all the regions that are demyelinated, we may be able to protect the brain a whole lot more. And this is what I was talking about the optic neuritis lesion that may have occurred 30 years earlier, but the individual had normal vision, and at autopsy, when you look at the optic nerve, it has not a shred of myelin, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind. So, with regards to types of multiple sclerosis, this is very important. You are all familiar with the relapsing remitting disease, where you get an attack, then you recover, and you get an attack, and then the Differences between attacks become few and far between, but the patient is worsening between attacks. And these cartoons are really, really nice in terms of making this point. Here the patient has returned to baseline. Here the patient did not return to baseline, and the patient is continuing. You can see between attacks the patient is continuing to worsen. And of course, this is primary progressive MS. When somebody says, what's an attack? They have never experienced an attack, and they're continuing to decline from day one. And uh, so I get asked all the time, as also my colleagues, um, am I now into the secondary progressive phase of this disease? So am I now relapsing disease or am I progressive disease? That's a question that all of you want to know. And I have a completely different take on this. I really believe that the relapse and the progression occur concurrently, not sequentially. So when a patient comes to me, with their first attack of optic neuritis. If you do a brain scan and measure the size of that brain, what we have found from studies is that it is already five standard deviations less than what it should be for that age. So the shrinking of the brain or the loss of brain tissue, the neurons, has already occurred at the very first attack, except it's not that apparent. So. Essentially, what it tells us is that as you go through the disease, the relapses become fewer and far between, and the progression becomes more prominent, where it was always there. It is not like it just started. So all these Venn diagrams that you have seen, you know, this is what we used to believe. This is relapsing disease. This is progression. Now we call it secondary progressive. Here is relapsing disease. Here is what is called transitional MS. I don't buy it. I, I don't think that's how it is at all. So the important thing is if we understand progression, and we are trying to understand progression, we really need to initiate those mechanisms of repair early in the course. Because even though you say somebody is relapsing and remitting, the process of atrophy is already there, and one needs to address it from day one. And we'll talk about that again in terms of where we go from here. So now we come to the immunology part of it, and, and what is very, very clear is that a relapse is mediated by the immune system. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When you have an attack that was caused by the immune system, and what you have here at the bottom is a vein, and these are the immune cells, and they leave the vein to the perivenular space, and they react with an antigen-presenting cell, what is called as microglia, and all the activation downstream occurs to cause ultimately injury to the myelin, and of course also to the axon. So 
This is a very simple diagram that I don't have to change from time to time because immunology is changing all the time. And if you look at some of the charts that you will see, the different arms, they need to be updated all the time because as we speak, it's changing. And one thing that I want to leave you with is that even though we make it out that the immune system is T cells, B cells, Th1 cells, Th2 cells, and you'll hear these terms used in terms of, you know, we don't want the Th1 cell because uh, it's pro-inflammatory. We want the Th2 cells because it's anti-inflammatory. All this is true, but nothing is a final cell. In other words, a T cell can become a B cell. There is very, very good evidence to suggest that. And a B cell can become a T cell. And how do we know that? Because there are certain types of leukemia cells that actually expressed, lymphoma cells that express T cell markers and B cell markers. And it was confusing in the beginning, but now we understand it better. So even though we talk about these as compartments of the immune system, they really do not function as independent compartments. It's a continuum. And that continuum is really what decides at the end of the day when somebody has injury or no injury. So what we have here is the blood vessel in which, in other words, the systemic immune system now enters the brain and causes injury through a variety of things that are complicated that leads to an attack and that attack is a relapse that occurs. A very important point that may escape most of us is the fact that the immune system peripherally is the culprit that causes injury to the brain. So when we got started, we didn't know that. And Larry Jacobs, who is well known in the field of multiple sclerosis for being a pioneer in trying to treat MS with interferon, what did he do? He basically did lumbar punctures on all patients to give the interferon. Patients came every week for uh, a lumbar puncture followed by interferon in injection because interferon does not get into the brain. So <clears throat> today we know that that is not important. A drug does not need to go across the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. One can modify the immune system peripherally and uh, that can lead to uh, attacks uh, or blockage of attacks. So I'm using this slide. The drugs that we use now, you see the sequestration and in there you see S1, P1, agonist, fingolimod. This drug is Jelenia. And I'm sure you'll hear more about this from Jack, um, who will be talking about the current therapies and future therapies. Jelenia, uh, or fingolimod, is a drug that works very well when uh, you give it, because within 24 hours after you administer the drug, most of these cells that are causing injury to the brain are in the lymph nodes and they cannot leave the lymph node. So they're trapped in the lymph nodes. They're sequestered in the lymph node. So it's a sequestration therapy. And when you stop it, it takes about two months before it reconstitutes, but it does come back. And what you have here is one of our most effective treatments, natalizumab, which is Tysabri. And of course, again, from the very first infusion, Tysabri is very effective in preventing these cells from migrating into the central nervous system and causing injury. Very, very effective drugs. And, and these drugs block um, occurrence of um, attacks. Protecting the blood-brain barrier. Again, the drugs that uh, do this is uh, interferon. And we also have glatiramer there because we didn't think glatiramer acted through the blood-brain barrier, but when clinical trials were done that compared interferon and glatiramer, the, 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 the Kaplan-Meier curves were almost on top of each other in terms of what happened with MRI and what happened clinically. We thought that glatiramer took six months for its effect. It doesn't. It starts just like interferon fairly quickly. <clears throat> but the point is that these drugs are not immunosuppressive. They don't kill the immune system. They don't uh, get rid of a certain population of cells. They just modify the flavor of the immune system from a pro-inflammatory, which is not good for you, to an anti-inflammatory state. <clears throat> and then, then we have the, the T cell modulators. To your right, you see Th1, Th2 shift. As I said, 
TH1 is uh, uh, the one that cause injury. TH2 is the one that is considered favorable. Again, these are all our way of looking at it, but uh, it may not necessarily be how the system works. And when the, or to the left, what you see is when you give high dose steroids, when you receive a gram of steroids for an acute event, the cell that is blocked is the monocyte macrophage, which is secreting all kinds of noxious substances which are blocked, and that causes uh, relief. And then cell depletion therapies. In other words, these are truly immunosuppressive drugs. And, 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 and uh, again, you'll hear about it. Anti-CD20 treatment has not hit the market yet. Uh, I, I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, Jack will be talking more about it. The name of the generic drug is uh, ocrelizumab, and ocrelizumab uh, uh, is an anti-CD20 blocker. N n uh, Lemtrada is the anti-CD52, uh, very aggressive form of uh, immune suppression. How does anti-CD20 work? Uh, this is the normal state on your right side, T cell, B cell in homeostasis. What you have here is an abnormal state where the, the T cells are programmed against your myelin or whatever antigen and feeds on the, the B cell and then it causes a T cell, B cell loop. And when you give an anti-CD20, which is a rituximab now or a crolizumab later, it blocks the attack. And, and it's a very, very effective treatment and we'll talk about it. The B cells also cause these antibody. These are the oligoclonal bands that you are accustomed to hearing, but if you wondered what those are, this is a normal, this is an abnormal. So, and now I'm going to come to, you know, what causes neurodegeneration? And this is a very important concept. It's a very busy looking slide, don't worry about it. The central theme is mitochondria. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and this, is where you get all the energy. And if the mitochondria is hurt, which it is when there is acute inflammation, it is not metabolizing glucose to produce ATP, which is your uh, energy stores. And now you have a situation where when you activate the nerve cell, you have sodium getting into it, it cannot get out because there is no energy. And when you bring in sodium into the cell, with it comes water and pretty soon you have an axon that's swollen and nothing, if nothing is done to restore energy, then that axon dies. So basically, in a nutshell, I think progressive disease, which is the next frontier, is really an injury to the mitochondria. And again, during break, I'll be happy to talk about. Stuart says, time up. So I just, I just want to leave you with uh, a picture of the stem cell and, and this will be a nice segue to to, to Jack, and, and essentially what uh, I want to leave you with is that there is hope because there is, these are stem cells that have come from the bone marrow uh, into the brain and caused brain tissue. Uh, and this is something that was shown in a patient who had leukemia and died from the leukemia even after a bone marrow transplant. And that uh, is, so it clearly shows that in human, you can actually get nerve cells formed from bone marrow. Now, with that caveat, I'm going to stop only to say that this, there is much, much more to it than the standard stem cell transfers that occur today, and we'll talk about it after Jack's and uh, Brian's talk is over. So I thank you for uh, your attention. I've enjoyed talking to you. I hope uh, you got something out of it. Thank you, thank you. I think Dom, Dr. Ramahan was a little nervous. He's speaking of our first program, but thank oh you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. All right, next we have Dr. Jack Burks, who's going to come on up. And Dr. Jack Burks is pretty well known in most parts of the US as well. And we have him coming up, and he'll speak to you about the emerging therapies, myelin, and a few other things. Come on up. Thank you. Thirty seconds. Thank you for coming to hear about the latest in multiple sclerosis. I've been, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk. And I'm also excited because I'm starting a new MS program at Nova University in uh, Davie next month. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to doing that. It's, it's, it's special because it's designed to give me more time with patients. So I have more individual time with patients, which seems to be a major issue uh, that I've heard over the past few years. And uh, so today, 
I'm going to go over 77 treatments in 30 minutes. <clears throat> so forgive me if I talk very fast. <laughs> um, and so um, at the end, though, I, I, I put these up, these slides up, so you'll have them to go back to, to look them up on the internet. Obviously, we can't talk about all of them. We, re we reviewed over 1,000 papers to put this talk together, and my uh, associate, Dr. Petra Vaj, is here. It's been very helpful, thank you. And um, it's, it's exciting in so many ways. And Dr. Ramahan talked about the immunology. It's so exciting. However, there were some other papers that I may not be able to get to today. Uh, I hope I can, I'll try to go fast so I can do that. That actually shows that the feel-good therapies that we talk about, you know, yoga and relaxation and exercise uh, are feel good, but you know, they don't really help the disease that much in general, it just makes people feel better. It's absolutely not true. There were papers presented uh, last month uh, at a big meeting that showed that balance exercises, they looked at the brain while people were doing balance exercises and afterwards, it changes the brain. It changes the connectivity. It changes the wiring. All well, same thing was true with cognitive. So the things we used to think were feel-good therapy actually changed the brain. So we call them alternative therapy. I, I define MS treatment as both drugs and, and therapies that, that you can do to help yourself. So I think that's important um, for you to understand that therapy is what you can do for yourself, not just what the doctor writes a prescription for. Um, oh. uh, to help, help me put this together, I actually went to a talk by Dr. Bruce Creed at the University of California in San Francisco, he's an MS expert, and I want to acknowledge him for that as well as acknowledging uh, Dr. Petrovi, my uh, research associate doctor, who has helped me do this. I'm going to start with MS relapses. And that's important because there's so much confusion about what is a relapse, how do you treat it, should I even tell my doctor if I have a relapse? It's important to tell your doctor because relapse contributes to the brain damage that uh, Dr. Ramahan showed so eloquently in his slides. And in fact, MS begins as a relapse in 85% of the patients. Um, it's, an, it's an acute episode of inflammation in the brain that causes damage to myelin, we know, but also to the axons, to, to the wires, and also to the neurons, the brain cells. So this is a imp very important aspect. You need to take care of yourself when you have a relapse. You need to talk to your doctor about how you can get rid of this relapse first. And of course, the symptoms depend on where the damage is. Now, I won't go into the details about that, but we, we define it as a set of symptoms that last more than 24 to 48 hours. So it isn't like if you get mad at your spouse and you feel badly for a couple hours, that's not a relapse, um, although you might think it is. And often, relapses uh, may take a few months, actually, several weeks to months to, uh, to get better. But we do have treatments for relapses that can shorten this time. And there are mainly three types of treatments. The first is high-dose steroids. You probably know uh, about the steroids. Uh, you can give them intravenously or orally, and they suppress the inflammation, those Th1 cells that Dr. Ramahan talked about. The second is ACTH, uh, which, is, which has steroid effects. It stimulates steroids as well, but it may have another factor called melanocortin stimulation, which may actually work directly on inflammation. So we're doing more research on that. We'll, we'll have more information as we go along, but it would then become an emerging therapy if we showed that to be happening. It's more costly, and it's usually administered only if steroids fail or if people can't tolerate them. The third, which is not used very often, fortunately, is for very severe relapses. It's called plasmapheresis, where basically you take the blood out, you cleanse it, and you put it back in, take out those bad antibodies. It's expensive, and it's a third-line therapy. Um, also, during a relapse, we don't want to forget to get treatment for the symptoms and to help your function. There's medications for pain and spasticity. Uh, rehabilitation therapy can be very helpful. Make sure you take care of your care partner because it puts stress on everybody. And then you need to learn about how do you prevent relapses. Dr. Ramhan talked about vitamin D, thank thankfully, but also stop smoking, low salt, and some other things that I'll talk about later. But one of the main reasons people have relapses is they're not adherent to the disease-modifying therapies. 50% of the people probably don't take their therapies often enough to help them as much as they could. 
So stay on your therapies. If you're having trouble with your therapies, talk to your doctor about why you're having trouble and maybe even switching. You must, these therapies do not work if you don't take them. So remember that when you're talking about relapses. And also psychological support's important. There's a, there's, sometimes people get bad and they feel bad. They, they maybe for a couple of days they'll feel really terrible. Is that a relapse? It could be, but it could be a pseudo relapse. It could be related to say a urinary tract infection. I have a lot, first thing I do when somebody comes in with a relapse, I check their urine. If they have a urinary tract infection, I treat the urinary tract infections. I don't give them steroids. Um, overheating, overexertion, psychological stress are all important things to consider that may not be real relapses, but pseudo relapses. And the treatments are aimed at those causes of the pseudo relapses, not steroids for the uh, relapse itself. So we went through th 77 emerging therapies. I'll do that in 30 minutes. <clears throat> I'm going to have to talk faster, won't I? Uh, and what, one of the important things is that over half are being designed to help people with progressive disease. Now, progressive disease has been the stepchild of MS. Uh, we can't do anything about it. Well, you're going to hear some exciting news today about what we can do about it. And in the future, you're going to hear more and more exciting news. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons we can do this is because Dr. Rahman talks about the immunology. We're understanding the immunology better. As we understand the immunology better, guess what? We can design treatments that are better. So they all work together. The scientists and the clinicians work together. Um, so the goals of the emerging therapies, one of the reasons we do this, we don't have a cure for MS. Uh, but many of these therapies really are terrific at reducing attacks, disability, and MRIs, and they can last for years. So I'm excited about what we have today and about what we're going to have in the future. Um, now, Dr. Rahman talked about myelin. Big focus now on how to repair myelin, how to regenerate myelin, how to stop the damage from myelin. So you'll, see, you'll hear a lot about that. I'll show you some slides as well. So it's not just about slowing down the progression of the disease. Mm -mm. No, no. We're talking about making people better, getting them, getting them functioning better. And, uh, and we're always trying to balance in these trials the efficacy, how good are they, and the risk. So that's the decision making here, balancing efficacy and risk. And that's what we try to do in these clinical trials. Um, I'm not going to talk about current therapies. It's not the topic. Today I talk about emerging therapies. Uh, but we have 13 terrific therapies that you need to learn more about, and that'll be another talk. Uh, how, and I am going to talk about possibly the first therapy for primary progressive disease. Uh, Dr. Ramahan mentioned it. I'll talk about it a little bit more. But I can tell you, as I think about this future for progressive disease, I feel the same excitement that I felt in 1992 when we had our first disease-modifying therapy. It's going to change the lives of so many people. So it's very exciting. And the things we learn with these new therapies are going to help us develop newer therapies. So there's going to be f second, third, fourth generation therapies that's going to help more and more people. So my goal today is to overwhelm you. I hope I've started already. Uh, my enthusiasm for new treatment options, especially with people with progressive disease. Um, and I hope to give a, a, a brief overview about what's coming down the pike. Uh, but I don't have time to do this in depth, and I apologize. But I'm gonna give you, an, I'm gonna take you on an airplane ride. We're gonna do this at 30,000 feet, and we're gonna go by very fast, so buckle your seat belts, uh, get my slides, this is on video, you can get my slides, look these treatments up. That's why I wanted to list them, so you can at least go back and look at uh, my website, uh, also addresses some of these issues. And, uh, and my first slide, if, if there's other questions, you know, let me know. I have an email address. I'll be happy to try to answer them. Uh, but I apologize for going so fast. Dr. Ramahan ended on stem cells. Let me start on stem cells. Um, and I'm encouraged by stem cells. I'll say that. But we're just starting. There are many challenges left. Uh, the concept is you... Uh, uh, take cells, hopefully from the patient's body, but maybe other sources, and you take them out, you reprogram them, you put them back in, and people get better. That's very simple. Um, and uh, what's really happening is that maybe those cells are changing and becoming, instead of activating the immune system, they suppress the immune system. That would be nice. They also may just be growing new cells 
that can function better. Or it could be that the immune therapy that we give patients during the preparing them for the stem cell transplant may actually be suppressing the immune system. And I'll just point out that Lemtrada, which is a very powerful drug that's now approved for MS, was considered one of these preparatory drugs in the first stem cell work. So maybe those drugs will also help the patients. So the sources of stem cells, you can get from bone marrow, embryos, umbilical cord, fat tissue, and you can even take skin. And the first one says, you take the patient's own skin, you transform them into stem cells and give them back to the patient. Pretty exciting. Um, I'm going to talk about two, two groups that are really doing good work. There's a lot of people who talk, talk big. These are people doing big. Dr. Nash in Seattle and Dr. Burt in Chicago. So when you see those names, read them, because they really they have a handle on this. Uh, but even that doesn't guarantee there are going to be prominent results that are permanent. So we have to keep looking at this situation. None of the stem cells have actually been compared to the current drugs that we have. So maybe they work, but maybe they don't work as well, maybe they don't work as long. So we have to look at all these different things. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop and tell you, just beware of unregulated stem cell clinics. Uh, it's, you're going to get bombarded with, oh, I'm going to cure your MS with my stem cells. Uh, well, I, in 2013, uh, a U.S. District Court said stem cells are considered drugs by the federal government and they must be regulated. That's not happening. That's not happening. There's a lot of cowboys out there. Uh, and you've got to watch out for those cowboys. Uh, because they're saying lots about anecdotal successes. Uh, and we need rigorous research. That's what you need. You need to talk to your doctor about rig what's the rigorous research. And some patients have died. Uh, and they, they actually had pockets of stem cells that looked like tumor cells. I'm not saying they cause tumors, but it's scary for me. And I can tell you, I'm not trying to scare you. But I'm just trying you to be, be careful investigating this. You're going to pay up the $50,000, know what you're getting, talk to your doctors, talk to the experts. I, say, I give a website here. Go to, go to the, your video and get this website. They have really great advice. Uh, and also, don't forget to ask your doctor. Don't do this without your doctor. Um, so, okay, so what is I'm excited. We've got unknowns. Uh, I want to compare these at some point to our, our current therapies to see which is better. Uh, the financial investment uh, is significant. It's not covered by insurance usually. And there can be serious side effects. So be careful of unregulated stem cell clinics. I end by saying the patience to wait may become a virtue for you. Keep that in mind. So I'm going to talk about other emerging therapies very briefly. Uh, monoclonal antibodies. They're antibodies that we make against specific targets. What we've been doing before is we've been dropping the bomb on the immune system and hoping there won't be enough collateral damage to hurt the patients and, and they will help the patients. Now we're developing very specific therapies that are aimed directly at a certain part of the immune system and not the other parts. It's a big advancement. So monoclonal therapies are really important and there's a therapy being, uh, being evaluated right now by the FDA. It's called diclizumab for relapsing and remitting MS. You take it every four weeks. So there'll be less shots, it's just under the skin. And it's had good results. And there's been some skin problems to talk to your doctor about, but no melanomas. Um, and I, I look forward to the FDA finishing their review. This is the one drug that's in for review right now. There's another drug that Dr. Ramahan mentioned called ocrelizumab. Uh, it's a, mono, mono, it's a, a monoclonal therapy for B cells. Diclizumab was T cells, this is for B cells. And uh, there's a mistake on the third line here, I'll point out. It says, producing cells that precipitate MS damage. I mean, eliminating cells that produce MS damage. This attacks those cells uh, compared to a very high dose interferon. It worked very well. Um, and the adverse events seem to be pretty similar. I look forward to the FDA reviewing this as possibly the first approved DMT for primary progressive MS. And I applaud their efforts. Other monoclonal antibodies are rituxim. I'm, just, I'm not going to even mention. We need to get moving with other things. You can look these up. Um, and then we have this, this, the, the treatments that are like gelinia. They, 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 they uh, sequester the bad lymphocytes and the lymph nodes so they can't get out. If they can't get out, they can't get to the brain. So that's great. Well, there's some other, there's some other treatments uh, for, like that that are being uh, developed. Tisabri-like actions. They keeps the 
the bad boys, the bad cells, out of the brain. They can circulate through the, through the body, but they don't get into the brain. So there are a couple like that. Um, and then there's some other cells that modulate the immune system. Uh, Laquinamide has been studied, and Laquinamide is a drug that's really interesting because it seems to help disability progression as much, if not more, than relapses. So it may end up being a drug that really is going to help disability. You know glutyramine acetate, Copaxone? Well, there is a, a generic out for that uh, that's been approved, uh, and there are more that are coming. So there are emerging therapies that are going to be copycats from glutyramine acetate. There's also another glutyramine acetate-like drug uh, called PL2301, which I won't talk about. There's a drug called cladribine, which, which we were very excited about several years ago. It really seemed to help, but we were concerned about cancer. Well, we've got the data now. It doesn't seem to have an increased risk of cancer, so you may see that resurfacing. And then there's another drug like Tecfidera that's being uh, uh, looked at as well. And then, I, I wish Dr. Rahman would have done this because it takes a long time. There's two kinds of immune system. There is, the, there is the adaptive immune system, which is the B and the T cells that we always talk about. But there's another type. It's called the innate immune system. If you scratch yourself, you get a response right away. That's the innate. That's the immediate response. The later response is when the body works through all sorts of mechanisms, you get the adaptive immune system. And we always say, well, it doesn't matter. The immediate immune system doesn't matter. MS is a disease of the adaptive or the T and B cell immune system. That's not true. The innate immune system may be very important, and the first two drugs are part of the innate, have an effect on the innate immune system. And, um, and then we have a drug that's already approved called mitoxantrum, which we never use because it causes leukemia and heart failure. But there's a drug like that that's being developed that may not have those side effects. Uh, estrogens are maybe important in MS. Estriol is the next one. Uh, women having, uh, getting pregnant don't have as many attacks. So what if you gave women estrogens when they weren't pregnant? Would that help? Mixed results so far. Parasites. Oh, I'd love to talk a little bit about parasites. Uh, it turns out people in Argentina who had MS and had parasites didn't have much MS. They had very mild MS. Parasites may modulate MS. So there are trials going on looking at giving people parasites, believe it or not, to help modulate their MS. Uh, now there are vaccinations and tolerations. How do you, we're trying to dampen down the immune system and trying to keep the immune system in, in, uh, intact. And there are four therapies I've listed there. The one I'm going to talk about just briefly is, the, um, is taking three peptides, little proteins of, of myelin, put them together, put them on a patch, and stopping the immune system damage. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, neuroprotection. OK, so now we've got these inflammation. But we have another process going on. It's called degeneration may or may not be related to inflammation, but it's the degeneration of the brain. People with progressive disease don't have much inflammation. They have a lot of degeneration. So we're looking at that, and there are a couple of, of ways that we're looking at that, and I'll show you some more in a minute. For the myelin, here's seven drugs that are, that are going to uh, increase myelin. Wow, terrific. I'll only talk about the first one, antilingo, um, and because it blocks the cells that block myelinate, remyelination. <laughs> So we're going to get rid of that, so there'll be more remyelination. The uh, preliminary results in optic neuritis, which is another demyelinating uh, condition related to MS, look very good. And I also said number six is a melanocortin-4 receptor. That's the ACTH that I talked about for relapses. There may be, there's some evidence that it may actually protect the cells. It's also in cell culture. It's not even in animals yet. But it's, we're thinking. We're thinking to help you. Um, and then we have a, number, a bunch of other drugs that are used for other other uh, therapies, like for hypertension, asthma, etc., they have some properties that may help MS. So now you're going to see a lot more work going on repurposing drugs that were made for something else that may help MS. It's a fascinating field, and here are some: a hypertensive drug, uh, statins for cholesterol, uh, a cell that may, or a hormone that makes red blood cells called erythropoietin. Um, anyway, you're going to see more and more of these, and, and look them up on the web, up on the video. Uh, epilepsy drugs like dilantin, uh, antibiotics uh, like tetracycline and a drug called minocycline. There's a drug for, uh, has been developed for ALS that may work in MS for neuroprotection. There's a, there's a, uh, 
a study being done at the University of Miami, Dr. Ramahan's group, called Axona, which is like, sort of like coconut oil. It was, it was developed for Alzheimer's disease, for cognition. It may help MS. It may increase the ketones in the brain and energy in the brain that can help people function better. And with that idea, actually some people are now postulating something called a ketogenic diet, which is what we use for epilepsy that might help MS. Lots of stuff going on. Now I'm gonna switch gears. Because remember I talked, MS therapies are things that you can do to help. Well, these are therapies that need no prescription, cost no money, and can be enormously helpful. And I'm gonna go through some of them very briefly. Uh, I'm gonna get my watch first. Um, first, avoid smoking. Just quit. Trust me, smoking is bad. It, it increases MRI lesions, it, it, it increases relapses, it increases progression of the disease. It's a bad thing to do. And good news is people who smoke have less brain atrophy after they smoke than before they smoked, than, than while they were smoking. Salt restriction. It's not the salt taker, Shemutz. It's all these processed foods we get. You know, all the restaurants love to, you know, the, the, the food in restaurants taste so good because they have a lot of salt in them. Start looking at salt content. Do you know what a can of soup has for salt? You know, it, you, it, you would never eat another can of uh, soup or eat processed foods if you actually read the labels. So start reading the labels. And uh, if you have a high salt intake, the relapses increase by almost four times and the MRI le lesions increase uh, dramatically. Don't do it. Obviously, limiting alcohol. Okay, other therapies. You want me to talk about biotin? It's, it's a vitamin B complex vitamin, but it's also called vitamin H. It's the drug that uh, has been given to progressive patients. It seems to help them. 91% of the patients felt improved. Actually, the objective results were not that dramatic, but nonetheless, we're looking at this kind of therapy, and we'll know more information as time goes on. It looks like it helps secondary progressive more than primary progressive, but it probably had some benefit for both. Vitamin D, Dr. Ramahan discussed, so I'm not going to in my brief time. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Nutrition. Overweight patients had six times increased risk for new brain lesions and eight times risk for increase in disability. Does that tell you something? That we ought to be exercising and watching our diet? Um, and, um, and the diet that looks like the best f for me is the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet. And these are basically fruits and vegetables, uh, less fats, et cetera. Uh, and you can read about that. But it, these are diets that may make a difference. And why may they make, make a difference? Because there's something called gut microbiomes. Uh, did anybody go to the talk last night? Uh, anyway. Gut microbiomes were talked about then. It's the hot topic in MS. Uh, the gut is the largest immune, we're talking about the bowels. It's the largest immune system in the body. Things that happen there affect things that happen in the brain. And so therefore, we know that the disease modifying therapies can change the gut. We know that diets can change the gut. So think about this. What if we developed a merging therapy, a probiotic, that changed the gut, so the gut doesn't signal the brain to do bad things. Uh, wishful thinking, but maybe not. All right, exercise and MS, I'm not gonna go through these, but just know that tread, walking on a treadmill for 20 minutes improves your cognition. Uh, ballroom, dances improve, ballroom dancing improves your cognition. These are studies. This is not somebody saying, I feel better. These are studies. Um, hippotherapy can be very helpful. Uh, aqua therapy, you know, get in that pool um, and uh, get more sleep. It appears to have an effect. Uh, coenzyme Q may be helpful. Uh, I talked about the balance thing, but also the cognitive rehab can actually rewire the brain, it appears. They do functional MRIs and they see changes in the brains to increase the connectivity in the brain. Isn't that exciting? We ought to be more enthusiastic about this. Cannabis. What do you say? <laughs> uh, there's some data that it may help some symptoms. Uh, here, are the, here are some of the side effects. Uh, so you got to think, you know, am, am I going to get uh, a little bit better with my bladder and, or my spasticity and pain? But this is what I'm going to have to put up with. Um, and uh, many issues. Number one is poor regulation in the growing dosing and testing. I, I see people 
Does the difference, does the, the type of marijuana you smoke difference? How do you know what the dose is <laughs> that you're toking? Uh, and we just don't know this. And we don't know the long-term deleterious effects. And if you look at the slide before, my big, one of my big concerns is this may have long-term cognitive problems. And there was a great neuroscientist philosopher who, um, his name was Jerry Garcia the, uh, of the Grateful Dead, <laughs> also known as a pothead. He was quoted as saying, pot makes you stupid. And if anybody should know, this great neuroscientist philosopher probably would know. So really be careful before you start putting that stuff in your body. I just don't think it's ready for prime time. If you think about MS, MS is toxic to the, thank you for the applause, because I get a, when, I, when I do this for national public radio, I get rotten apple, rotten tomatoes thrown at me. Um, MS is toxic to the brain in many ways. Marijuana is also toxic. It has potential bad habits. So why in the world do you want to combine these toxins to the brain without proof of efficacy? So the devil you know may be better than the devil you don't know. So let's get some information. Other life enhancement therapies, I'm not going to talk about any of them. You've seen them. Pay more attention to them. Try to change your lifestyle to, help to incorporate more of these. And in conclusions, these emerging therapies are going to add terrific uh, treatment options for you in the next few years. I'm really excited. Unfortunately, many of the things I showed you today may not make it, but at least we're trying and we're going to learn from the drugs that don't make it to make better drugs that will make it. Uh, and we're going to have more therapies. So my last slide is a take home message. Keep the faith in MS research and remember that happiness is a state of mind, not a state of health. Some of the happiest MS patients I know are in wheelchairs. They've, as, as uh, Jimmy Hugo, the great, the great uh, skier, said, it's not the cards you dealt, it's the way you play them. So work about playing them. And I'll end by saying that a positive attitude and a focus on your resilience is going to go a long way to improving your quality of life. OK, you can unbuckle your seatbelts now. The boss has come. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody lost an earring. I was supposed to come in wearing this, but I just didn't feel comfortable about it. So it's up here. Whoever lost a, I don't know what it is. So, yeah. Well, it's up here, and maybe later on you can match it up to the one that we see on the other ear. All right. But right now, let's introduce Brian Steingo, and uh, most of you already know him. He doesn't need an introduction. He's going to introduce himself. Let's get started. What did you come? Well, still good morning. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, my topic was nutrition. Oh. <laughs> so thank you, Jack, for doing half of my topic. So when I go through the slides, I can go through them pretty quickly. So uh, you know I like to talk about the land of MS because we all have different approaches. Jack took you up high in the sky. I'm going to keep you down on the land. And just when you have MS, this is many things that we could talk about. And I'm going to talk about the office visit as well at some point. Uh, you heard about a lot of the science of MS and the new drugs. And I'm going to talk about some more basic things as we go along. But you can see in the land of MS, you have many different things you could talk about. We could talk about how you diagnose MS. You've heard some about that, about how the MRI scan was a great advance uh, in helping us diagnose MS. Treatments, you've heard about treatments. Treating relapses, how do we treat the disease? The disease-modifying drugs, think about how amazing that is. In May 1993, the first drug for MS was approved, Betisheron. So if we were sitting here in November of 1992, we'd pretty much have you know, nothing much to talk about. So it's an amazing advance. If you think about it, that Charcot first died, described MS in about 1868, almost 150 years ago. Most of us weren't born then. Well, my grandsons, my grandsons think I, wa I was, but you know, <laughs> try and tell them I wasn't. But, but think about this in the last 20 years, what we have with MS, all our amazing drugs that we have. And the result of having amazing drugs to actually treat MS is that we've paid more attention to treating the symptoms of MS. More neurologists want to treat MS. If you went to see a neurologist 20 years ago, there was a common kind of refrain. Diagnose and adios. Neurologists didn't want to treat people with MS. There wasn't much you could offer them. And so people had a hard time getting treated properly. There were employment issues, society reasons. People didn't want to declare that they had MS for being afraid of 
you know, being, losing their jobs. And so MS has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. In this land of MS, you can see that I have the symptom tower. Why is it the symptom tower? So you've got this big land, island, and the tower is massive because there are many symptoms of MS. And we'll touch on some of the symptoms, and you've already heard some discussion on the symptoms. MS research is huge. You're going to hear about MS research. You've heard about MS research. The support for MS, the social support, the National MS Society, the MS Association, MS Views and News, there are a huge number of organizations that can help give support. And then support groups, and this kind of meeting, there's a huge amount of support. And then most importantly, self-help. So this is how MS often starts. One of the things Stuart asked me to talk about was symptoms. I can't talk in detail, just symptoms themselves. We could spend all day talking about that. But you can see how these common symptoms of MS, how, how often they start. So optic neuritis will, will start in 14 to 29% of patients. Balance problems, dizziness, weakness, these are all the common symptoms that you're very aware of. And you could look at the symptoms in different ways. When you think about the symptom, you go for your visit and you could say, how are my symptoms doing? Are they stable? Are they constant? Are they fluctuating? Just different ways about thinking of how your symptoms are doing. And here I listed some of the symptoms. We could probably make a much longer list of symptoms. These are some of the symptoms you commonly see, and you could divide them up into visual symptoms. Uh, you know that fatigue is a very common problem. There could be what we call motor symptoms, which would refer to weakness, spasticity. You could have trouble with your balance, cerebellar problems, trouble walking, tremors, uh, memory problems, very common in MS, often common cause of disability in younger MS patients that are unable to work, bladder and bowel problems, sexual problems, numbness, tingling, pain, depression. So there are a wide list of problems that we have to be prepared to deal with. But just the most important group of problems that I want to just highlight, but is the invisible symptoms of MS, the ones that you can't see. And I put the quote in over there, and the National MS Society, as you know, has a little pamphlet that they give out and says, but you look so good. How often are you told how good you look? You don't always look good, but people tell you that. But, but how, how, this is a very important thing in MS. People, people may look good, but they don't necessarily feel good. They could have some of these invisible symptoms. And someone just looking at you, at your place of work, thinks you look great. Why can't you work? You can't remember anything. You have pain. You have fatigue. How do you measure fatigue? Very hard. So the invisible symptoms of MS, these three particularly are highlighted. Fatigue, pain, cognitive problems are very important symptoms of MS that we have to deal with and ask you about. Now, that whole list of symptoms that you saw before was what we could call the primary symptoms of MS. That's a direct result of those lesions. When you saw the MRI scans that Dr. Ramahan showed, you saw all those white spots on the brain, those lesions, that scarring on the brain, that inflammation in the brain, that damage to the myelin and the axons in the brain. Those are the primary symptoms of MS, directly due to the MS lesions. But what's the result of having all those lesions? You could have loss of balance. You fall. You have injuries. You break things. You have urinary tract infections, a major cause of disability in people with MS, especially progressive MS. Anxiety and depression, impaired activities of daily living, all the secondary things that can happen, and they're very important. And then we have the tertiary symptoms of MS. As a result of all those things that have, hap that have happened, the primary and secondary symptoms, you have all these things. Loss of job, family disruption, divorce, social isolation, loss of independence, and loss of self-esteem. So there's a whole host of symptoms that we always need to be aware about, and each one at any particular time may become important. Now, we can't talk about them all today, the symptoms. But the reason I put this up, and you might not see it, I don't know, you've seen a lot of complicated slides today. This is also one of those. It's got a lot of information. Remember, all this is going to be available for you on YouTube. So in 10 days' time, you can go to YouTube and look at, look at this. What does this highlight for you? If we look at all your symptoms and treat you, look how many different medications we have that we could give to you. We could treat fatigue, or depression, or spasticity, or pain, or your bowel and your bladder, or your walking. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different symptoms, and that means we can give you a whole bunch of different medications. And we have to think about that carefully, because we might end up with polypharmacy. And we might give you many drugs. And we must think about the interactions between these drugs. We could give you medications for your MS. We could give you medications for your MS symptoms. And we could give you medications for other conditions. You might have high hypertension, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. You could be diabetic. There's many other things that you could have. And we have to constantly be aware and see, do these drugs interact with each other? It's very important that we think about that and do that. 
And this tells you something in a little more detail about the fact that you could have other chronic diseases. That's why you get many different drugs. I won't go back. We've discussed that. And so this, as you know, is a favorite topic of mine, talking about your office visit. This is the most important time uh, with MS, is when you visit your neurologist. And so you need to make the most of that visit. And so therefore, we have put, and I'll go here, you're going to see this in a minute. I don't know how well it shows up, but I'll go into more detail about that. We put together a questionnaire that you fill in. I have it in my office already. Those who come there know that we ask you to fill this in every time. And I want you to write these things down, because when you go and visit your neurologist, that's the time to discuss all the issues. So think about them ahead of time. Write down what is your complaint, and what are your symptoms, and what are all the medications you're taking, and your questions and your summary. If you put all those down, this makes your visit very meaningful. When you bring me this sheet of paper and you hand it to me, uh, in one second, I'm going to look at this. In 30 seconds, I can look at this, and it already sets the tone for our visit. We know what we're going to talk about. We're really looking at what are the main complaints, what are your medications. For your medications, and some of you have heard me talk about this before, full down, write in all your medications and all your supplements. Do not write no change, please. Right? Have you ever gone to Walgreens and said, can I get no change? <laughs> have you tried that? Doesn't work. I tried that. I said, can I get no change? Half of my patients are taking no change. What is it? It's great. And, and half of the people are taking the same. It doesn't, you know, we need to know what you're taking. Medications and supplements, all very important. Write down your questions. We know what our topic is for that day. You've seen how many symptoms there are. Some are stable, some are not. Write them down. Write down the questions so we know what we need to talk about. And in a summary, at the end of the visit, you could do that. You could make a summary. At the end of the visit, our plan for today is the following. We're going to check your vitamin D level, you're going to stop smoking, and you're going to exercise. That's our plan for today, or whatever it might be. It's very important to leave with a plan formulated, because the one thing I don't want is the door question. And some of you that have heard me before know what the door question is, and some of you don't. What's the door question? The door question is, we've sat there and had a meeting for 35 minutes, and the next person is already knocking on the door. And we spoke for 30 minutes. And as you're at the door, you say, I forgot to ask you about my bladder. Well, that's a simple thing. Let's talk about your bladder in seven seconds. Not exactly. So we don't want door questions. We want to decide beforehand. We need to know. And if you fill in this office sheet, uh, this, this questionnaire, and so this questionnaire, which uh, you will see is online on MS Views and News, you will find this. If you don't have one in your own physician's office, you probably have some variation of this, but you can, you can copy it from MS Views and News. It's right there on the MS Views and News page. Print it out. Fill in all the questions before you go in for the visit. So when you go in, you've had time to think about this. Write these things down beforehand so you don't forget at the last minute to ask about the door question. I think I'm having competition from food soon. Um, but here you see neurological symptoms, your medications. When were you last here? When was your last MRI scan? A huge amount of information that's very important. And then we ask you other things that are important. Your social history, that's important. What, how are you doing? Are you working? Do you smoke? Do you drink alcohol? How much exercise do you do? And then we have psychological questions, very important. How are you managing? Do you need some help? Do you need some support? And then we're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions about other things. How is your mental health? And how is your general health? How's your, how, how about bowel and bladder in your heart and your lungs and all kinds of other things? We want to know about all those things, and it's all listed over here. This is the best way I could put it together for this, but on MS Views and News, it looks much better than this when you print it out. I think it's something very important to optimize the value of your visit. Now I'm just going to talk about then some of the symptoms. We clearly don't have time to discuss all the symptoms, but fatigue is a very important symptom, an often disabling symptom. And how do you explain fatigue to someone? If someone says to you, are you fatigued, how do you explain it? Because oftentimes when they look at you, especially in your workplace, they think you're lazy. How many lazy people are there here? I bet there's a bunch of you. Or how many of you lack motivation? Or it's in your head. So it's not that you're fatigued, you're just lazy. You've got no motivation, you know, that's, that's who you are. So fatigue of MS is very important and people don't understand that very well. But this is, defines it. It's a lack of physical or mental energy that interferes with your activities, and there's no explanation for it. It just happens. You've had a good night's rest, and you might still be fatigued. 
But when you have fatigue, it's very important for us to think about what kind of fatigue you have. Because not all fatigue is simply me writing for you and saying take ProVigil, and ProVigil is going to be great for you or some other drug. That's the primary fatigue of MS. That's the fatigue that you have just because you have MS that we do not actually understand very well. But you could have fatigue for other reasons, so-called secondary MS fatigue. It's very important for us to say, is there something else that could be causing your fatigue that we can treat? Is your fatigue because you're weak or deconditioned? Because you're just not exercising? Or are you fatigued because you don't sleep well? And why are you not sleeping well? Is it because you're depressed? Or do you have bladder problems that keep you up all night? Uh, and there are other causes. Medication side effects could make you have fatigue. So there's a bunch of different things. So when you say you have fatigue, I need to investigate that with you and say, you're having fatigue perhaps because you have so much pain and spasticity that you don't sleep well at night. So the treatment for your fatigue is not to give you provision for your fatigue. The treatment for your fatigue must be to find the cause of your fatigue, treat your spasticity, treat your pain, treat your bladder problem, or whatever it is. So that is fatigue. We do have some medications. One of the older medications is amantadine. It was a drug that was discovered coincidentally. It's used for lots of other things. It's a benign, fairly benign drug, so we can often start with that, because once we go beyond that, we go to the stimulants, and ProVigil uh, has been shown uh, to work. There was a study done by Dr. Ramahan. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, but he did a study and showed that ProVigil helps people with MS. And yet insurance companies, we have a constant fight every week or every day with insurance companies to get ProVigil approved. And then we can use stimulants. If those drugs are not approved, we can try stimulants, be aware of all their side effects. But these are some of the medications that we can use for fatigue. Once we have dealt with all the other issues, and made sure we're doing everything else to help your symptoms. Just want to talk a little bit about sleep. We don't have a lot of time to go into all the symptoms, but sleep apnea can occur in people with MS. And there's a questionnaire over there that I listed. It's called the Stock Bank Questionnaire. It tells you if you have a higher risk. So in MS patients, there is a higher risk of sleep apnea, and that tells you some of the risks that you have. If you're snoring, if you're tired, if you're overweight, if you have observed apnea, uh, if, depending on your age, male, so we have an older male with a larger neck, hypertension, you're a setup for sleep apnea, which increases the risk for strokes and heart disease. Now, what do you think about the risk for, of strokes and heart disease in people with MS? There was a Swedish study that was done that showed that people with MS have a higher risk of strokes and heart disease, especially women. So we need to be aware of the interactions between all conditions. And pain and MS. Some of you that have pain for a long time, and even now may be told, MS does not cause pain. Is that true or false? There used to be a time where they used to say, you have pain, so you can't have MS. Of course, that's totally false. And there can be many reasons for having pain in MS. It could be muscular pain. You could have muscle pain and stiffness, muscle spasms. The result of the way that you walk, and because of your muscle stiffness, and because you don't walk normally, your gait is abnormal, causes all kind of joint pain. And you could have headaches. So there are many types of pain with MS. How do we evaluate pain? Here's another acronym for evaluating pain, and it says, how do we look at pain when you have pain? We're going to ask you, how did it start? Where is it located? How long does it last for? What's the character of the pain? What makes it better? What makes it worse? So we have that acronym over there that you can look at when you go on the YouTube. Now, this is a definition of pain. It's summarizing causes of pain. Pain can be muscular pain. We spoke about that. Or it can be what we call neuropathic pain, which is direct pain due to the involvement of the nerves and the nerve pathways. Uh, and then we can look at pain in a different way. Is the pain acute? Did it just start? Or is it a chronic pain, something you've had for a long time? Or is it a paroxysmal pain? That means a pain that comes and goes. The best example, a great example of that would be trigeminal neuralgia, which is not uncommon in people with MS. Here are some of the ways people report neuropathic pain. They often describe it as a burning pain. And the area could be sensitive to touch. You could have pins and needles, tingling, electrical pains, all kinds of things. Trigeminal neuralgia is facial pain. It's not an uncommon kind of pain. You could have an MS. And then lumitzine. You all, many of you know that lumitzine, classically, when someone bends their head, flexes their head down, they may feel a tingling, radiating, discomforting sensation that radiates down their, into their arms or their legs. And then there's the MS hug, is another cause of MS type pain, where people may feel that they have an actual hug. So these are different examples of MS pain. And how do we treat pain with MS? There are two main sets of medications that are used to treat neuropathic pain. You're familiar with the seizure medications, such as gabapentin, Lyrica, carbamazepine, which is Tegretol, 
oxcarbazepine, which is trileptal. These are seizure medications used to treat pain. And then we also use antidepressants sometimes. You can see them up there, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, Cymbalta. These are generally the medications we use to treat neuropathic pain. And then musculoskeletal pain, we can use non-steroidal drugs. As you know from recent stuff that's been published, you should use these in moderation, not on a regular basis, because they increase the risk for other conditions, heart conditions and kidney conditions. But we could use antidepressants for these two. We use antispasticity drugs, baclofen, tizanidine. Botox can be used for spasticity, causing muscle pain. Uh, the importance of exercise, physical therapy, and massage cannot be stressed enough. And finally, at the end is opioids. It's the last choice of treating pain with MS is opioids. Opioids, narcotics means we failed with everything else, but we sometimes have to resort to that and refer someone for pain management. And what about cognitive function in MS? The commonest cause of disability in a young person with MS is cognitive dysfunction. And if you look over there, you'll see the things that are affected. Could be memory, especially short-term memory, acquiring information, retaining information, attention and concentration, information processing, executive functioning, planning and prioritizing, visual spatial functions, verbal fluency. So short-term memory problems, multitasking, being organized, very important things uh, to deal with an MS. Many people with MS, up to two-thirds of people with MS have some cognitive dysfunction. Uh, it doesn't always correlate with other forms. So someone could physically be very capable and you f do a physical exam and don't find much, yet they complain of a memory problem. It doesn't always correlate. It's not necessary that the person that has the most physical problem is the person with the most cognitive dysfunction. The two of them don't. There are some, uh, they don't coordinate always together. Cognitive dysfunction can be seen very early. They've studied people that are diagnosed with MS early with their first episode of MS and looked at cognitive problems. And early on, they already see cognitive dysfunction. Management of cognitive dysfunction. The way we deal with this is very important. Why? Because we actually have no medication that treats cognitive dysfunction. Some of the drugs that have been used to treat Alzheimer's disease have been used, but they really don't seem to be very effective. So it's very important to do mental stimulation. Keep your mind as active as possible. Do exercises, mental exercises. Be organized. There are, there's actually books that are written about organization and decluttering and is very important as a great stress if someone's not organized. So those are very important. And physical exercise is very important. And how about a sense of purpose? Keeping yourself, having something to do, something to look forward to, whatever it might be, an interest, a hobby, helping family members are, are very important. Hobbies, diet, sleep, Managing sleep, stress, and laughter. You've heard about all that already. And some great points about the invisible self. He said, do not become another person, an unrecognizable version of yourself, less than what you are. If you have MS, you are not a different person. You are the same person. And deal with it. Look at yourself, view yourself as the same way. And associate yourself with people that view you the same way. There are always negative and toxic people around them. You can just, you need to move away from them. Special people will get to know you. Spend more time with the people that appreciate who you are, that you're still the same person. Many people will not bother to take the time to, to see who you are and to be patient, develop that great quality of patience, compassion, all these topics, patience, compassion, kindness, they're all topics. So Pierre uh, Ferrucci spoke about the power of kindness. If you go on the internet, you'll find an actual website called thekindkindness.com. Uh, it's very important that people around you are kind and that you're kind too. Be patient, show appreciation. Remember those two, those two things in our society. When I think about extinction sometimes, I thought about this. I was reading about the extinction of the tiger because people in India years ago hunted them. Fortunately, now they're more protected. But I'm thinking there's extinction of words and actions. Please, thank you. Things like that, we need to be. I think the more we do of that, the more we appreciate and give and take, I think we're all gonna feel much better. And so this is some of the things with mental health. I put there at the bottom a bucket list. We always have a bucket list of what to do, and we should also have a bucket list of what not to do. I'm not gonna do this because every time I do this particular thing, it drives me crazy. Um, for example, I'm driving on the road, and somebody cuts me off. And what's your tendency? Get mad, maybe. You've got to learn, be calm. If they cut you off, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, it's something wrong with them. 
Or how about you're on the road and you want to turn. So you put out your turn signal and what do people next to you do? Speed up. <laughs> how, how about you be patient and, and you actually let someone in? So things like to do. I'm not going to be aggravated by small things because there's so many things that can happen around. Don't get bothered by the small stuff. There's books about that. Don't get aggravated by the small stuff. Forgiveness, patience, generosity, respect, loyalty, gratitude, all that stuff is from that book. The Power of Kindness talks about these things. And if you do those things, you're all going to be much happier people. You heard already from Dr. Burks about the importance of that. And then self-help. All these things that are very important. And I put this acronym over here about the things you do for yourself. So we've spoken a lot today about the drugs we can give you to manage your disease and the drugs we can give you to, to manage your symptoms. But there's a lot of this you have to do yourself. Manage temperature, expectations. When you're on a new medication, have an understanding of what the purpose of it is supposed to be. How is it supposed to help me? Adherence. You heard Dr. Burke spoke about how important it is to take your medication. We spoke, I mentioned you about mental health and sleep. Your outlook, a positive outlook, managing fatigue, food, relationships, interactions. Uh, this team of friends, everything you do is very important. How important is vitamin D? Vitamin D is so important that everybody has spoken about it. Dr. Ramahan spoke about it. Dr. Burke spoke about it. I'm actually supposed to talk about nutrition, but they've already mentioned it, so I'm not even going to talk too much about vitamin D. But here's what I call defensive nutrition. You know about this one? Eat healthy, eat breakfast, don't skip meals. General facts. So when you have MS, we need to concentrate on your general wellness and your general well-being. MS is part of your whole. It's not an isolated thing. Everything else about you we need to take care of. Eat more fiber. Eat plants, fruits and vegetables, fluids, supplements, vitamin D and B12. B12 is important for the nervous system in general. Defensive dining. So calorie and, con calorie and content control. It's not only important what you eat, and, and you've heard some of that already, it's also important how much of it you eat. You don't have to have large portions. And there's many studies that have been done that showing we don't need large portions. Rather eat small portions. Part of the way you get that is that you eat slower. If you eat too fast, the food gets into your stomach and the brain hasn't got a message yet that you've got food there, and so you want more and more because your brain says, I need food. But if you eat slow, the food gets in there, it's slowly digested, the brain is getting a message, you've got some food, and it says, oh, we've got enough, we don't need more. So share the portion. And who do you share with? Share with yourself. So I suggest when you go to a restaurant where they always, we know that they give us portions that are way too large, the first thing you do when they, when the, when the, when, when the serving the portion to you is, you ask for a, a, a sty your doggy bear, your styrofoam box, say, can I have one? You haven't even eaten yet, but ask for it. And split your food in two. I guarantee if you, if you separate it and put half of it away already, you've got another meal, and what, and what you've got in your plate, spread it out, it's going to be enough. Just eat slowly, enjoy the mood. Salad dressing on the side. Avoid the calories, avoid the salt. Alcohol has calories. And then the three bad things at the bottom, you heard about those already. Salt, sugar. Everyone's spoken about sugar. Sugar's a poison for every one of us. So for those who have MS and those who don't have MS, sugar is a poison. Avoid, avoid sodas that have sugar. They're poisonous. Avoid other food with sugar. Don't put in, if you need a sweetener, by all means add a sweetener. That's the one good S. No salt, no sugar, no saturated fat, bad S's. Stevia, you can use stevia as a, as a sweetener that you certainly can substitute if you need one. And the plants, this is from Joel Furman, you may have seen him on, C on PBS. Uh, what he calls combs, C-O-M-B-S, colored vegetables, onions, mushrooms, berries and beans, seeds. This should be a mainstay of a diet. I'm not going to speak too much about vitamin D. You heard about it. The only thing I want to say about vitamin D is that a common question we have is, well, how much should I take? And I'm saying, let's measure your vitamin D level. And we want to aim for a level of about 75. The good thing about it is we can measure your vitamin D level. So we know how much you should take by measuring your level. And you might need a large amount. You might need 10,000 or even 15,000 units a day. As long as we measure your level, we can make sure we don't get to toxic levels. Um, some of this already Dr. Burke spoke about the salt part, and we know that salt intake was correlated with the risk for MS. Uh, you can read more details of the numbers over there, but people that had a lot of, ate a lot of salt had a greater risk for relapses. Now what about this interesting stuff on fatty acids? You go back to the very original studies of Dr. Swank. So Dr. Swank, over 100, well he, he, Dr. Swank died at the age of 99, and probably published his book over 50 years ago, and everyone, most people know about the Swank diet. 
And he stressed the importance of some fatty acids and said, avoid saturated fatty acids and have plant-based or unsaturated, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So here I quoted a recent study that was from a group from Norway, and they said that people who consume the most foods containing plant-based polyunsaturated fatty acids had the lowest MS risk, but they couldn't confirm it with unsaturated fatty acids from fish. So they said, plants are great, but we can't confirm that the unsaturated fatty acids from fish help you. And then there's a study from Australia where they said, we had a study and we said that if you eat fatty acids from fish, it's great, but we can't confirm it from plants. So you pick. I think what you need to, what I think what you need to say is polyunsaturated fatty acids are good for you. That's what you need. You need to have polyunsaturated fatty acids, then you need to avoid saturated fatty acids, which essentially are animal uh, fatty acids. You can eat animal for lunch today, probably that's one of your options. But maybe after that you'll rethink it and you can eat more plants and vegetables. Um, and then there was a study that was published over here recently in, in the journal Immunity, and they showed that the dietary fatty acids directly influence the T cells that you've heard about before. T cells are an important part of the immune system, and the dietary fatty acids that we ate directly impacted the T cells in the gastrointestinal tract. And you've heard before about some, some, some uh, Dr. Burks mentioned to you about obesity. Again, a study showing that obesity in, in adolescents, especially young women, increases the risk for MS. So if you have someone, if you have a child who is, uh, and you have, you have MS, now you have a child that has MS, and therefore they have an increased risk for MS genetically, and they're obese, and they're vitamin D deficient, look at the risks now. We're starting to try and say, can we do preventive stuff? Like we want to prevent heart disease and strokes. Maybe with MS we can do the same thing. And so you caution your 20-year-old daughter and say, I have MS, so you're at risk, and you're vitamin D deficient, and you're obese, and you're smoking. Guess what? They're all risks, so we have some way of trying to prevent these risks. And this was in the Momentum magazine, and she aptly titled A Gut Reaction to MS, talking about the, 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 the link that you heard before from Dr. Burks between the gastrointestinal symptom and MS. We have trillions of, billions or trillions of bacteria living in our gastrointestinal tract, and some of them are anti-inflammatory and some of them are pro-inflammatory, and so by changing our diet, we can probably make more anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory bacteria. All of us are exposed to too many antibiotics. You know, you sneeze three times and your nose runs and you call your family doctor and say, I've got a cold and they prescribe you an antibiotic. And what does that do to the bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract? It, it, you know, it, it kills some of them and maybe it alters the balance. And some people feel that because we've been exposed to an excessive amount of antibiotics, that's changed our gastrointestinal tract. There is the so-called hygiene hypothesis where we definitely see less MS in third world countries where people are not that much into hygiene and washing their hands and not touching hands and, you know, if the kid drops something on the floor, they eat it. Things like that, the hygiene hypothesis. So the gastrointestinal tract and the microbiome are very important. Dr. Weiner presented at CMSC something titled The Gut, The Next Frontier in MS Therapy. And so I've always thought what you put into your gastrointestinal tract, what you eat, is very important. Modifying the bacteria, trying to get more anti, uh, out, get rid of the anti-inflammatory bacteria, get more pro-bacteria, the whole subject of probiotics, having the right probiotics uh, is very important, I believe. I listed over here, again, as uh, you heard earlier, this will be on YouTube, so if you want to look at any of these uh, references, you certainly can. They talk about some of the topics that I uh, feel are important. Uh, let's see, exercise, the final part, I just wanted to mention a couple of points over here, the importance of exercise. So physical and mental exercise cannot be stressed enough. And there is an exercise for everybody. If you're in a wheelchair, if you can't walk, there is still exercise. There are seated exercises. You can do stretching exercise. I can't import, uh, emphasize enough how important physical exercise is. And guess what? Physical exercise is also important for your memory. So they have done studies and shown that people that did more physical exercise had better memories. It's important when you do exercise that you like to do it. So these are the exercises we always want to do. Balance exercise, endurance exercise, stressing, stretching and strengthening exercises. But make the exercise comfortable. Do it in a cool environment. Don't overheat yourself. Dress cool, use a fan, use AC. Use cool beverages to keep you cool. Use spray mist bottles. It's most important that you are comfortable doing the exercise because otherwise you won't. One of the commonest things I see people do is tell me they can't exercise. And I say, why not? They'll say, I exercised, as you told me, three months ago for, for half an hour, and I was exhausted. 
So what do you do after that? You exercise for half an hour, you're exhausted, so what do you do? Well, that's too much, I can't exercise anymore. Well, no, how about trying five minutes? Remember, if you don't take the first step, you're never gonna get anywhere for anything. So I said, you have gotta ex- just start five minutes of exercise. Do five minutes a day. If that's easy, do 10 minutes. Build it up gradually. It will build up your endurance. I want you to get to the point where exercise is something you want to do. Well, I can't do anything today because I haven't exercised yet. And I'm only going to do five or ten minutes. Very important to exercise, mental and physical. This says what I just said. It has to be, you have to be motivated. Make it comfortable. Smoking and MS. Uh, I just put this up over here because you heard about that before. That smoking appears to be related to a risk for the progression of MS. Uh, you can read more detail of that if you want to. And I'm going to end. Where's Stuart? I'm, I'm, this is the last one. You don't have to wave at me anymore. Uh, the pillars of MS, this is what I call the pillars of MS, things I want you, that you should do for yourself, is take vitamin D. Don't say, oh, I take it once in a while. Take your vitamin D every day. Check your level. Have a diet that is correct. Have a diet that's low in salt. Try and cut sugar out of your diet. Cut saturated fats out of your diet. No smoking. Exercise. Support in. Appreciate what people do for you. And at the same time, support out. You can appreciate... You can, give, you can do things. Because you have MS doesn't mean it's the end of, you know, it's not the end. It's a new chapter. Do things as well. Find a purpose. Have different interests, different hobbies. Find some purpose, whatever it might be. And uh, I think that's, that's the end of my purpose today. So thank you all for listening. That is not fair that he got a bigger applause than me. Totally not fair. Listen, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Ramahan to come on up, Dr. Burks to come on up, the th- and Dr. Steinger will be seated at this table. Craig is that person there. He's going to raise his hand. Jennifer is down there. She's raising her hand. I'm going to be in the middle. Those guys will be on the sides, all right? By the way, you guys are really lucky because I'm getting text messages from people at home that hear the clatter of the silverware and the plates and they're asking what's for them. (laughs) So that's where we're at now, okay? So as soon as these guys get seated. So while uh, Stuart is getting ready, I would like to make a point uh, about uh, a drug that we are testing at the University of Miami. It's not a drug, it's a diet supplement. Dr. Burks talked about Axona, and, and this is a drug or supplement that has been approved for treatment in Alzheimer's disease for improvement of memory. And uh, we are now testing it. We are the only site that is testing it at, uh, in the US. It's a, it's a study that is funded by the, uh, by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. And we Stand need about 150 subjects. So it's a very steep uh, recruitment that we need and anybody with any cognitive issues if you have we're not necessarily talking about severe cognitive issues even mild please contact brett somewhere here in the back and we would really like to enroll you there are only three visits at the whole study is for three months and this is how we develop new agents for treatment and we really would appreciate your participation we do the study in, in uh, Boca, and we also do it uh, at uh, our facility in Miami. Okay, thank you. So, to begin with, I'm going to start off with a question that's been sent in by text, all right? Since they use my phone, I might as well start here. Can one of the doctors elaborate on the findings presented at the Ectrims in Barcelona that Abagio has proven to help diminish brain atrophy? How reliable was this trial? Can any of you answer that? I was in Barcelona, but I did, uh, did not see this particular abstract. Uh, and the question, Stuart, was how does uh, Abagio compare with uh, aspartate? No. To, ex- to explain how Abagio works to diminish brain atrophy, I think it was. Hold on a second. How has d- Abagio helped to prove and to diminish brain atrophy? Okay, so basically, Brain atrophy is a surrogate for progression, meaning the normal rate of brain atrophy, we are all losing brain over time. There's 100,000 nerve cells that are lost a day. 
that brain atrophy process is about 0.1% of your total volume of brain. What happens in MS patients sometimes, it is as high as 1% loss a year. So it's a huge difference between 0.1 or less to 1% or more. And, 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 and that is an indicator generally of progression, although this is not proven at this point. And all the drugs are looking to see how they influence brain atrophy. I don't know what particular study that, they, that Stuart is talking about with regards to Abagio, but probably the best agent that has shown brain atrophy slowing and, and slowing at a very early stage is Fingolimod. And this was probably the first drug to change the rate of brain atrophy and the change could be shown as early as six months after starting the treatment. And I'm not, I'm not really aware that Abajo had that effect, uh, but uh, I, it's possible because it has an effect on progression. Uh, one thing that one has to distinguish is the, the progression or disability that they talk about in the clinical trial is not the secondary progression that we are talking about. The EDSS scores at the end of the trial is really relapse related disability rather than the true progression. So there is a little bit of a difference and most drugs that uh, have an effect on relapse might also have an effect on progression, although it's much harder to show that effect. I, I reviewed that paper and uh, it turns out the way they looked at uh, atrophy, they looked at it uh, in a more um, maybe a scientific way and they showed there was atrophy because it was, it was uh, surprising that they decreased relapses, decreased progression, decreased MRI, but didn't decrease atrophy. So they looked at it this way and they showed it did decrease atrophy. So that was a consistent. Okay, next question. Jennifer, you have one back there? I have a question over here. The question is for any of the three doctors. My friend here keeps telling me, uh, you guys all say that smoking is no good for people with MS. Now, my friend here tells me that smoking cigar is okay, but cigarette is not. So he keeps smoking cigars and he says it's quite fine. I want to hear from you guys, tell him the difference between. Wow, you're putting your friend on the spot? <laughs> you're doing him a favor because now that we all know who he is, <laughs> he's got to quit. I mean, depend, if, if you have a cigar once in a while for relaxation, that's okay. If you do it on a regular basis, there's no difference from cigarette smoking. So it depends how much, it depends how much your friend over there that we can all see it depends how much he smokes. Next question on this side of the room. Hello. Um, doctors, in cases where um, it's not quite certain which kind of MS you have, for example, uh, do you have primary progressive or maybe you have relapsing? You're not really sure because maybe in the past there was some question of symptoms or whether or not they were related to MS or not. Um, is there any harm in taking a medication for MS to at least try to see if it would work as opposed to just not doing anything and risking, well, maybe you have um, relapsing MS and you could be treated, um, but you're not being treated because you think you might have primary progressive. Is there any um, indication just to take it anyway, just to see if it'll work? Would it, would it harm you? Would it, would it um, make the primary progressive uh, more advanced if you take um, a medication for relapsing MS? That's the temptation. Well, why don't you give it a try? But the fact is that there are criteria for differ differentiating between relapsing remaining MS and primary progressive MS. And I think that uh, all three of us would be comfortable doing that. I think most doctors would be comfortable saying, this is it. Why would you take a drug that doesn't work, that may be expensive and toxic, or side, uh, there may be side effects? So I think you have to be very careful. You have to use judgment about what medication you're going to be taking. And I would depend on your doctor's uh, advice, because he understands the characterization of these types of MS very much. And I don't think people should be taking non-FDA approved drugs uh, that may not work and may cause side effects. Okay, the next question is over here. Uh, it's been uh, suggested that uh, having good sleep is beneficial for somebody with MS. And if, say, uh, something like uh, Ambien has been prescribed, 
How safe is it to take on a regular basis? Yeah, I mean, sleep, sleep is, is, is important for everybody. Uh, the problem with sleep medications is that sometimes they cause side effects, such as making someone drowsy when they wake up or have a loss of balance. Some people get up, they feel a little groggy, groggy they may have a loss of balance. Uh, so if you have MS and your balance is not great and you take a medication, we've got to make sure when you, when you get up that, you, that you're alert and that you don't have a loss of balance and fall. So the, say, the downside of these medications is that they do increase the risk of falling. They do increase that. They've clearly looked at that in older patients, that there's an increased risk of falling when people take sleep medications on a regular basis. And so if you have MS, you have to be very wary of your balance, and when you get up to be careful when you're walking around, I think that's one of the key things. There are other side effects of sleeping medications, like nightmares and night walking, uh, but the main problem, the main concern we have with someone with MS, if there's a balance problem, is be very careful that this is not affecting your balance so we have to always, like with everything else, weigh up the risks and the benefits. Okay, sure. So, one of the things that I find lots of times is patients who take chronically drugs for sleep, uh, particularly Ambien uh, or any form of Valium class of drugs. And in addition to some other major concerns, what these drugs can do is, number one, chronic use of benzos can cause depression, and certain types of benzos and ambient can cause difficulties with memory. And these are two major long-term issues related to these drugs. In fact, certain benzodiazepines actually will cause blackouts, where you actually had a whole conversation with somebody and couldn't remember a word of it. So I do not encourage medication as, as the answer for insomnia. I think there are better ways to deal with it. One of the things that I recommend actually is to exercise and then to have a hot shower before you go to bed, which sometimes helps. You know, people take a, a hot glass of milk, sometimes melatonin. Those things are harmless way to approach it, but uh, chronic use of Ambien and or other medications in the Valium class is probably not a good idea. Thank you. I, I agree. Uh, drugs are for short-term use for very stressful situations like grieving or some situation in life. It's not a good idea to take long-term sleep medicines. Next question for the doctors. A woman just wrote in. By the way, there's like a hundred questions coming in, all right? All right. Um, how much estrid estradiol was given in a study? If my doc wants to try estrogen supplements, what dose would be potentially helpful for my MS? So estradiol is a hormone of pregnancy, and that is the reason why Dr. Washko, who is at uh, the University of Southern California, did the trials in the combination of estradiol with Copaxone or placebo. Um, actually, everybody got Copaxone, and it's either placebo or estradiol, and they could show an effect. It was not a spectacular effect, but there was an effect. And uh, is it recommended at this point? No. Uh, because there are also some issues that are associated with uh, use of sex hormones in terms of carcinogenesis and other, other issues that are probably long term. Uh, she's still pursuing the study and there's an extension into males where uh, the testosterone type of drugs are, are going to be tested. There is some experimental evidence to suggest that these hormones have an effect on uh, uh, autoimmune disorders in general. There is what is called NZB, NZW mice, which are prone to get lupus damage to the kidney. And it's seen in the females, but not in the males. If you castrate the females, they become more, uh, uh, if you castrate the males, they become more vulnerable. And if you add a, a, androgens to the female, they become relatively protected. There's a whole host of literature about it, but it's, it looks like there is an effect. Uh, we do not proactively use hormones to treat MS, not even estriol or estradiol, but uh, you know, one of the things that come up is birth control pills, is there an issue with it? Um, the standard birth control pills, especially the low estrogen ones are the ones we recommend for birth control, it's really not a problem, but we don't really use the hormones as treatment at this point. I didn't answer that question, uh, even though I talked about it, because I don't know the dose. Uh, you know, they have your doctor look up the results of the UCLA and they'll give you the specific doses that they used, but it's, it's not a really high dose. It's more like the birth control use. Great. Next question, in the back of the room. 
Hi, doctors. I know that treating tremors is very difficult. Um, where do you go and what do you do after you've exhausted the medications, the oral medications that are available and haven't proven to work? Uh, I'm, you, you know my opinion on it. <laughs> so I'm going to defer to my colleagues over here because you guys are well aware of my take on tremors and we, we want to hear what they say about tremors. A very difficult, one of the very difficult symptoms of MS to treat is tremors. And uh, so I would like to hear the opinion of my colleagues over here about managing tremors. Outside of giving Indorel and Primadone and Topamax, uh, we want to hear anything else. Any take on, we have standard drugs like that we use, Propranolol, Primadone, uh, Topamax. So we want to hear what else do we have for tremors outside of using those. Uh, I, th I think you start by trying to find out the non-medication ways to treat tremor, like stress management, a deep breathing exercises, and stuff like, stuff like that. They usually don't work. We tried the medications that Dr. Steingo mentioned. They usually don't work very well. And uh, we don't have a really good treatment for tremors. You know, the tremors in Parkinson's disease are treated with deep brain stimulation. And there are people thinking about, maybe we do something like that. But right now, that's not ready for prime time. Uh, I apologize. We don't have good treatments for tremors. Thank you. Next question. Where's Craig? Craig's down there. Uh, it's, this is for any of the doctors. What do you think of the vitamin B12 injections to help with fatigue? Vitamin, vitamin B12 is important for the nervous system for everybody. So every person sitting in this room needs to have vitamin B12. If you're deficient in vitamin B12, then you could be fatigued. If you're deficient in vitamin B12, it can affect the brain and the nervous system. People that are deficient in vitamin B12, if it's very severe, can actually develop dementia. So it's important for the function of the brain. It's also important for the blood. If you are vitamin B12 deficient, you can have a certain type of anemia. So we know it's very important to take B12. If you have a disease like MS, that's a disease of the nervous system, it's important to have enough B12. Uh, and just as we spoke before about measuring vitamin D, you can measure your vitamin B12 level. That's it. If you actually measure your vitamin B12 level and it's in an adequate range and the results are normal, taking extra vitamin B12 does nothing at all. People often say they take B12 shots because it helps their fatigue and you measure the level and it's thousands and it's clearly just a placebo effect. If there's enough B12 in your system by measuring it in the blood and it's helping you, it's probably a placebo effect, which is something that does work. It's not bad, but we can measure B12 and make sure you take enough. It's not a standard treatment uh, for this, as Dr. Steingo said, and, and, uh, but you can take a little sublingual tablet and once a day, and if it makes you feel better, it's water-soluble, it's probably not going to hurt you, uh, but if you're vitamin B12 deficient, it might help you a lot, but I'd talk to your doctor about, am I deficient? So your daily requirement of vitamin B12 is one microgram a day, and one shot of B12 is 1,000 micrograms. And one shot of B12 will saturate all your liver storage sites. And we know that because that's how we do the so-called Schilling's test. With, because when you give radioactive B12, you have to make sure that the liver stores are saturated. So patients get a milligram of B12 in injection. So that's about three years worth of B12. So that, very true, but I see people taking it every month or sometimes every week. And sometimes I also hear about how I can tell just before the shot wears out that I'm ready for my next shot. The reality is probably has nothing to do with the B12 because if you measure the levels, it's sky high. And uh, so one injection of B12 is really good for three years and, um, and it saturates the sites. And unless you really have a condition called pernicious anemia, which is, as Dr. Stango mentioned, a disorder of the blood, which also has an associated involvement in the brain, there really is no point in taking a lot of B12. All you do is you pee it out. Question from the audience that was handed to me, and that is, do MS patients have more phobias such as claustrophobia and social anxiety? Mm, I don't think so, but I... Mm. No, I, don't, I, I think they have the same amount that everybody else has. I don't think so. Do you think so? I don't. You know, I, I've I never think seen the, that. I think the multiple Maybe I missed that chapter. I think the multiple sclerosis is associated with anxiety and depression. Uh, and that, so I think we see those sort of things in multiple sclerosis patients because it's a very stressful disease. Um, 
But but to say it's 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 caused by multiple sclerosis is probably caused by a reaction to the multiple sclerosis. Thank you very much. Question in the back of the room. My question would be to any of the doctors on the panel. Um, for those that have nerve ending pain or leg syndrome, uh, which is something that occurs in a lot of us, mainly me, I've been on Lyrica for about four or five years, and I've taken it three times a day. I still have the nerve ending pain and the shooting pains and hot spots. What else is there for that? I mean, so for, for, firstly, I'd look at your dose of Lyrica. Uh, if you, you may not be on the maximum dose, so we may be able to give you more Lyrica. Uh, there are other seizure medications we sometimes use for pain. Carbamazepine, known as Tegretol, is a very old, older medication. It's been around a long time. Personally, I think it's a highly effective medication. The reason we don't use it as much is because of the side effect profile. So if one medication is ineffective, it might be worth considering something like switching to another medication. And then we can add, as we said before, some of the antidepressants, like amitriptyline or nortriptyline or cymbal to also help with pain. So typically it'd be the antidepressant, anti seizures family of medications uh, that we're gonna use for mostly for treating nerve pain. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, some people will use TENS units, these little stimulating units to help. I mean, there, there are a number of things that we try uh, but I must say that it's not a, a treatment that we work very well with, except for the medications that Dr. Steingo talked about. Okay, next question in the back of the room. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I did, uh, thank you very much for your, your time this afternoon, this weekend. Um, my question is regarding uh, stroke. I saw on one of the slides a few minutes ago, uh, MS patients are susceptible to stroke. I had a minor event this weekend, this past week, that, that was brought to my attention for the first time, and then I saw it today. So I was curious how the stroke um, revealed itself, or how is it involved with MS? Yeah, what, 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 what was the, what was the, the question is the relationship between strokes and MS. Strokes and MS? Oh, you discussed that. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. I said there was a, a Swedish study that showed that if you had MS, there was an increased risk of strokes and heart disease. Uh, more so in women than men, but there was a relationship that people that had MS had an increased risk of strokes in MS, and it goes to what I said too, that taking care of your MS means taking care of your whole person, eating healthy, taking your vitamin D, exercising, it's all part of general well-being. And as follow-up to that, was it any relationship to the heart disease and the MS as well? Same thing, it's, it's cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease was increased in, in the Swedish study, was shown to be increased in people with MS. Especially, as I said, more so in women than men, but in, in, in women and men, there was an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in people that had MS. Sir, I'm sorry. Do you mind me asking, the cardiovascular disease, are you referring to thickening of the heart, heart walls, like the, one of the chambers thickening over one of the other chambers? Because that's what's happened to me in my left ventricle. No, that refers to cardiovascular disease, means affecting the vascular, means the blood vessels. So there was problems, there was the same equivalent of someone having a heart attack due to hardening of the arteries, uh, obstruction of the coronary artery, more that than affecting the muscle directly. It wasn't an effect of affecting the muscle, it was affecting the blood supply to the heart and the blood supply to the brain. So I just want to make a comment about, you know, this is probably not an area that has been researched into as much as we would like to. Uh, I do think that there are some concerns in MS patients, and the reason why I say that is when we were a center in Ohio recruiting for the trial for Fingolimod, where you actually need to do an electrocardiogram and look at uh, the heart situation before you put the patient on it, we had an unexpectedly large number of patients who had all kinds of cardiac arrhythmias that disqualified them, you know, young people that you wouldn't expect to have issues. And I thought there's a higher smoking population there, and I thought it was related to the smoking. But when you look at the population here in Miami, I see the same thing even in non-smokers. So it's possible that some of the lesions that are present in the spinal cord may actually have an effect on the autonomic nervous system, which may have an influence on rate and rhythm of the heart. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be looked at. But uh, I have a feeling that if you do 
a study, you will find uh, that there is probably an increased incidence of arrhythmias. And I asked Novartis to give us the electrocardiograms of the rejects, the people who didn't go on the study because of cardiovascular issues. And they told me they don't keep the EKGs, they throw it out. So basically there was, it would have been a great opportunity to look at a very large number of MS patients, EKGs, but it didn't happen. Okay, next question. What's the difference on a brain MRI between the small spots and the larger spots? And you could tell us what the damage the larger spots can do. So, certainly you don't want a larger plaque compared to a smaller plaque because, uh, you know, clearly the amount of damage that's happening with the larger lesion is, is more, intuitively it is more, but it's much more than the size of the lesion. It is the nature of the pathology that is what is important. You can have a small lesion in which all the axons are gone that will cost you more disability than a large demyelinating lesions, lesion where the axons are intact. So it's not just a matter of size of the lesion, its location is important. As I said, a lesion in the spinal cord is significantly more disabling sometimes than a lesion in the brain. And again, is the axon intact or not intact? This is also important from the standpoint of response of some of the medications we use. Ampira, you have one out of three people who take Ampira who respond to the drug, and that's because the type of pathology in that individual may be that the axons are intact and the myelin is gone, and that's the type of patient that can be helped with Ampira. But if the axons are gone, even Ampira will not help. So two out of three people that go, that we test for Ampira, probably end up not uh, being a candidate, and that's what we saw in this study as well. So the simple answer is you don't want a larger lesion than a smaller lesion, but more important than the size of the lesion is the nature of the pathology. Okay, we only have uh, approximately 20 minutes left to questions and answers, so we're going to try to move things along. Yeah, my question for the panel is what your opinion is of taking something, a supplement like melatonin for long-term insomnia issues? Melatonin. melatonin. Your thoughts? On, you talked about melatonin. She's asking, "What is is melatonin okay for insomnia issues?" Yeah, I mean, there's no so melatonin is one of those things where there's no you know there's no controlled scientific study, uh, and I think I think it's okay. I don't have I, I have not seen anything that says it's not something that you could take for a long time, but there's no controlled study. It's one of those things that you read about. If you go on the internet and read about supplements for MS, as you know, you're going to find 375 things. And that's in the first hour. In the second hour, you'll find more things. There's hundreds of things that people write about. You know, and melatonin is, uh, is, does work for some people. And I think if you try melatonin, um, I, I wouldn't have an objection to it. Yeah. At the same time, I, I agree with everything you said, is look for, look for what causes the sleep problem. And can you deal with the sleep problem with stress management? Uh, what Dr. Ravan said, it, how you do your nighttime preparations before you go to bed. There's a lot of ways to deal with sleep. Melatonin is one of them, and it, it does work with some people, but not others. Just want to add and uh, echo what uh, Jack just said, which is, I think, getting to the root of the problem of uh, the insomnia is very important. Because especially in MS patients uh, who have bladder issues, if you are up on the hour, by the hour, to go to the bathroom, you're not going to get uh, a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I can remember situations in which we started intermittent bladder catheterization on a patient because he was retaining a lot of urine in the bladder and it was incomplete emptying each time. And when you empty the bladder and go to bed, the, you get a much more restful night of sleep. And he said, why didn't I start this before? It was like, you know, all of a sudden, he's able to sleep through three and four hours before he has the urge to go to the bathroom. So there are a lot of factors that come into play that actually influences sleep. And if you don't get good sleep, then you get fatigue. And like you said, provisional is not going to make any difference. And, uh, and the other point is that, you know, you, you think putting on somebody on bladder medications, oxybutynin is the answer. If they have night not everybody. Problem, but, uh, Sometimes what you find is that they produce a lot of urine during the night, which, is, which we all do. So really putting a patient on something that reduces the amount of urine production during the night is something also that we use. 
I'm going to emphasize what Dr. Steingo said. Sleep apnea. A lot of MS patients have sleep apnea. If you're having trouble sleeping, talk to your doctor about could this be sleep apnea. Okay, Thank we have a lot of people out here that have a lot of questions, and we only have 15 minutes. So I'm going to ask that we only get one answer. From You guys are going to have to figure out who's going to answer it, and we get one answer, all right? And that's it. Because otherwise, we're not going to get around to most of these people. Craig's got one out there, and then we again go forward okay are there any different treatment options today for someone who just has spinal ms and has a clean brain or is it still the same treatment options as same treatment options brain spinal cord bad news both of them get treated uh, and take care of yourself okay one over here um, actually, I kind of have two questions, but one is um, I can swallow. I have a problem, problem swallowing. Things get stuck in my throat. Um, medications get stuck in my throat, and food just slide, <clears throat> slides down my throat. It's been going on for like a couple of years, and I don't know what to do. And also, um, I'm having a problem breathing uh, lately. I just can't catch my breath, if that's an MS issue. So, Jennifer, can you repeat the question? Uh, I, I'm sorry. She's have uh, you need to see a speech and language pathologist for your swallowing. That's a serious issue. Your breathing problems may be related to your swallowing problems. You need help. You need special help. And uh, it's a problem we see in MS, and I worry about it, so get help. All right. Over here, quick question again. Uh, question. Any idea when ocrelizumab may become available for those with PPMS? Uh, yeah, University of Miami was one of the sites for the opera, as well as the oratorio study. The opera is for uh, the relapsing disease, and oratorio is for the progressive disease. The, both studies were successful, and in spring of 2016, the company will file with the FDA, and it's not on fast track, so it usually takes about a year. So spring of 2017, it'll be on the market. We hope. Uh, which, what are the names of the probiotics that you recommend? I mean, there are, there are thousands of probiotics. And the, the one, yeah, I mean, you've got to look at the, the ones that may be, that, and I'll just give you general categories, are probiotics that are anti-inflammatory. So lactobacillus is an example. And so you want probiotics that are lactobacillus or bifidobacteria. That's the groups you mostly want to look at bifidobacteria or lactobacillus. And then you can look up and, and, and supplement your diet. I mean, basically we're talking about for eating fermented foods. So you can find yogurt and other products that are fermented products uh, that have been around that are in different recipes uh, with fermented foods and then lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, I think are the two that I know about the most. Uh, you can read a ton of stuff on, on, on probiotics, but I think those two are the ones that I would recommend the most. Thank you, panel. Um, one person said that large lesions lead to disability. Of course, it sends chills through my spine. I believe in the, that the brain is the new frontier. There's a lot that we don't know. And I also believe in neuroplasticity. Can we not um, train our brains to circumvent this huge hole and get the job done in maybe 20 steps instead of one in the simplistic view? And I also have another question. What was the question? What was, what was the question? The question is, is there a way to train the brain to work the way around the large lesions? The answer to that is yes. I think the brain does have plasticity. And I think that uh, some of the data that I talked about with the balance exercise to show that there was more circuitry when you actually exercise the brain in that area is, is helpful. Uh, Dr. Rahman, you want to come in? So neuronal plasticity is... is this phenomenon where, just like you said, the brain is able to circumvent and, 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 and reroute the signal. And if you look at stroke patients that have acutely lost function and do PET studies, what you find is the rerouting occurs within minutes of the stroke. And then there is a long-term remodeling of the brain also that occurs. A study was done in MS in which they actually looked at patients who had optic neuritis and recovered 100% of their vision back. And if you look at the PET scan in those patients, this was the study done from Queen Square, London. They showed that 
you and I and everybody who have never had optic neuritis will just activate the back of the brain with the occipital cortex, which is where visual cortex is. But in someone who recovered from optic neuritis, there are activation areas that occur in the parietal lobe, the amygdala, parts of the hippocampus, and, and parts of the brain that you do not associate with the vision. So, <clears throat> yes, there is a greater area that is activated in someone who lost vision in one eye or both eye. Although the vision has come back, it is at the expense of more brain working. Next question. Person wants to know about a JC virus um, antidote vaccine. Is there something available yet? And if so, when is it going to become available? I mean, the answer, the simple answer is no. You know, we, so we, again, we're not going to go into high science at this point. There is currently, there is no known treatment for get, getting JC virus, being JC virus positive gives you a risk for developing PML. There is at this point no effective treatment for PML. Uh, there are things that can be done. If you're on a drug like Tysabri, we will wash it out, do plasma exchange. Uh, there are antiviral drugs that are tried. Uh, but there is at this point, I, I can't say to you that we, have a, we are on top of this. Uh, there is a trial that is being launched with a new antiviral drug for, uh, for JC virus. Uh, it's going to be uh, initiated next year. Hopefully uh, it will work. But right now we try some antiviral drugs, but I have to say there is no effective treatment at this point in time. So I just want to mention about the vaccine. This, the, the, I, I don't know who asked that question, but it, it is sort of cutting edge stuff that is going on with JC virus. Uh, Roland Martin from uh, uh, Germany is the one who is leading this effort to vaccinate against JC virus. And, 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 and I do believe in this as well, which is that people who have high titers of JC virus uh, seem to be for some reason protected from getting. And, and that is coming from, if you look at the, the curves of when someone gets PML, it is really, after three years, it sort of flattens out. It, become, it doesn't keep on rising. And it may be because you've sort of selected for the people who are probably not going to get. And if you look at a lot of them, they have very high titers of the virus. So in a situation where you're blocking the cells from getting to the brain to clear the virus, it may be the antibody that is helping that individual to remain without PML. So the type of antibody that someone has is probably going to be important. And th this is all conjectural at this point. Roland Martin treated only four patients with PML and they actually created a vaccine that will get rid of the virus because of its activity against the glycoprotein, which is the outer protein of the virus. So I can envision a situation where we might be able to vaccinate an individual, but it's not quite there yet. Thank you for that answer. In the back of the room, in the back of the room. Over here. What's your opinion about amino acid for people with MS? Amino acid supplements. Amino acid supplements? No, nothing, nothing special for MS other than part of your good general diet. Uh, there's no specific amino acid supplement that, that we're going to tell you to take. Just have a good general diet, get your adequate protein intake, there's no specific amino acid that you need to take in, for MS. Okay, next question, back okay. there. Okay, um, Dr. Ramahan, you had mentioned about the MRI shows well for the wearing of the myelin, but what tests are there to check for the axons and the neurons? Is there a particular type of MRI I need to ask for? Or are there other tests? So if I heard you correctly, you want to know what specific type of tests in MRI one can do to look at the axons and the, and the neurons, is that right? Correct. Okay, so the regular MRI is just nothing but a map of water. It is protons, and the biggest source of proton is H2O, which is water. And so it's really a map of bound and free water that the computer is drawing for you, and that's really the image that you see. So with proton imaging, you really do, you know, myelin is the one that stands apart, and so you, you really only see the bright signal coming from loss of myelin. There is really no good way to look at the axon, but you can actually do some studies which are mainly spectroscopy, and the spectroscopic technique uses a peak that you see in, when you do the spectrum, 
of what is called as N-acetyl aspartate, NAA. And NAA is produced by the mitochondria and it is, it, it is in the, it present in the cell body, which is in the cerebral cortex, and it's also present in the white matter, which is myelin. So if you detect NAA in the white matter, it's all coming from the axon. And what you find is that in areas where you have lost axon, you can actually show a smaller peak of N acetyl aspartate. So there are ways by which you can do this, but it's not, uh, there's, there's no good way to do this easily. So the standard MRI will not pick up axonal loss. Neuronal loss coming from the, uh, coming from the cortex can be measured by measuring segmental um, loss of volume in the gray matter compared to the white matter, and that's basically what we can do. We only have five minutes left. We only have five minutes left. I'm sorry, you can't answer that. <laughs> All right? We have five minutes left. We're going to go. We have only three questions left here, and that's it. I'm sorry for that. Anybody who has questions after this, whether you're watching live online or you have any questions from out here in the audience, then I need you to please send it by email to me, and we'll have one of the physicians answer, because we now have an Ask the MS Clinicians Digest on our website, where monthly, all the questions that are being asked of us each month are going to be posted there by the various clinicians that are working with us, okay? So, one right there. What do you recommend to help MS itching? Itching, is, itching goes in that classification that I mentioned about abnormal sensations, whether it be a burning sensation or skin sensitivity, and so we would try some of those. So firstly, the first thing to do is make sure it's from your MS, that you're not allergic to anything else, like your new, you know, lawn, like some new, uh, something new you're using to do your laundry. Make sure there's no other cause for it. So let's say we've ruled all those things out, and then we might try the same medications we use for other sensory abnormalities. We might go through those same medications, gabapentin, Lyrica, and if those don't work, then there's a medication we sometimes use that's quite effective. It's called Atarax, A-T-A-R-A-X, Atarax. That is a medication that sometimes helps with itching. So if you've tried all the other usual remedies, Atarax is something that does help. All right, who's the next one? Craig, you got one down there? If not, I'll ask my question first. After you start an MS therapy drug, um, you might have some side effects, and they say, oh, try the drug for a while to see till your body can get used to the side effects. How long do you suggest you wait for the side effect to go away? And in this case, it's muscle weakness in the legs. So one of the things that I tell patients is almost all the drugs that we use have side effects of some sort. Uh, whether it was mild or, or significant. I would prefer that an individual give it a try for at least three to six months. Of course, after three months, if, the, if you're getting attacks and if there are significant attacks, uh, that's actually failure rather than side effects uh, from the drug. And so this, the short answer is at least three months, ideally six months, that you really give it a try to get rid of uh, the side effects. And a lot of people start to tolerate the drug as you go into it because you do get used to it. And for example, Tecfidera, a drug that we use oral, can have in the beginning some problems, but it can become less and less as you stay on it. And that's probably true for the interferon where you get the flu-like side effects and, and Pocopax on the injection reactions and the itching and so on. So I think when you start a treatment, if you, if you drop it right after a month or less, You'll go through all 13 drugs in a very short time. Thank you for that. The last question for this session came from the outside again, and that is the person wants to know why they are not allowed to give blood at the blood banks. So, since we do not know the cause of MS, you could have a potential situation where you transferred a possible agent from an individual with MS to someone who did not have MS. It is just a precaution. Uh, if you have had cancer, uh, sometimes they basically tell you don't do it. Uh, again, because the cause of cancer is not known. So there are certain disorders in which it's not recommended that you give blood, even if you want to give blood. It may even be a restriction for organ donation, but I don't know that for a fact whether it is. 
I would encourage you to say that you'd like to donate and then let somebody decide whether uh, they want to take the organ or not. But blood transfusions are generally not acceptable in a disorder where we don't know the cause. And if somebody found out that there is an, uh, there is an agent that is circulating in the blood, especially during exacerbation, it, it, it is activated and you can detect it once we know the cause. And if you gave blood during that time, maybe potentially, especially a young individual can get this disorder. So it's more of a precaution than anything else. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I want to thank you all for coming down here today. I have, I have something to give to each of them. It's a plaque for their recognition for speaking at today's program. Yeah. Yay. Stand up, please, and I'll hold it up and let our photographers take photos of you. Then that would be a great start. Yes. 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 Ah, you had somebody else's name. All right, so thank you again. And after these gentlemen are down, we're going to have our urologist come up and speak with you about bladder issues. Okay, everybody heard that with from me without a microphone? That's good. So our urologist is coming up next to speak about bladder issues. My name is Harvey Samwitz. I'm a urologist in uh, Aventura and Pembroke Pines. Um, my, um, in addition to uh, being uh, board certified in general urology, I'm also board certified in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, which is how I became uh, particularly interested in, uh, in multiple sclerosis patients because it involves a lot of neurourology which is somewhat of a subspecialty of general urology. Um, I didn't uh, put down my, uh, my address, I apologize, uh, but I will uh, just uh, 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 mention my office number is 305-466-9111 in Dade and 954-430-3999 in Broward. So I'll stick around after the question and answer session in case you have some personal issues you would like to speak. So as far as urological implications of multiple sclerosis, uh, the most common is the uh, symptom of frequency, urine, uh, urinary frequency and urgency. Um, and that includes the nighttime uh, uh, frequency, which is known as nocturia. Uh, th there's also the uh, significant problem of incontinence, uh, recurring urinary tract infections. Uh, some patients will progress on to urinary retention uh, and there's a number of other issues that uh, we're going to discuss. So this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about in the next uh, hour or so. So the prevalence of, of urological problems is quite significant in this group of patients. Uh, it, uh, it's sometimes the presenting symptoms. The initial uh, co complaint for the patient is urinary symptoms. In approximately 10% of MS patients, it's their, uh, our, their initial uh, complaint. In 2%, it's uh, their only complaint, and they are diagnosed for MS as a result. Uh, the large number of patients that have urological uh, implications of MS runs between about uh, 50 to 90 percent of all uh, of the MS patients. The most common complaint for these, this group of patients is what is known as detrusor hyperreflexia. Uh, essentially, that's overactive bladder. So some of the terms that I used in my talk are medical terms, and I apologize, and, and I'll try to uh, use the generic terms. Um, it's often a challenge to speak to MS uh, uh, groups because you're a fairly sophisticated audience. You know a lot about medicine. And um, I try to uh, make sure that my talks are, are to the broader uh, population, but uh, I've always been impressed that my MS patients are much more sophisticated than the, uh, the usual patient. So as I said, about uh, 50 to 90 percent of patients do have voiding symptoms as a result of their MS. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, some of these issues that are not just specific to MS patients. These, these ur urinary complaints are quite common and uh, they're not necessarily just specific to MS patients. There are some issues that are specific and I'll get into that as well. Uh, it used to be that 
mortality was associated with about 5 to 55 percent of MS patients as a result of the urological complications. Either uh, they developed a urosepsis, meaning they developed an overwhelming urinary tract infection, or they developed renal failure. Fortunately, nowadays, that's, that number is much, much lower. It's closer to the 5 percent. So overactive bladder is an extremely common phenomenon. That's the same as detrusor hyperreflexia in an MS patient. The difference of the terminology is that when we don't really know why a patient has urinary frequency and urgency, we refer to it as overactive bladder. When we know of a neurological explanation, a, a, a diagnosis that is attributable to the urinary frequency and urgency, we call it detrusor hyperreflexia. But it's really the same animal, uh, quite frankly. Uh, this slide says that over 33 million men and women are affected by overactive bladder. The most recent uh, uh, statistic I've seen is 46 million. The, the problem increases with age. So. Uh, and it's more common in females than it is in males. So that this problem of urinary frequency urgency is not specific to the MS population, but it is uh, uh, obviously much more common in this population, but it's a huge problem uh, throughout uh, uh, most patients as we get older. So, to understand the whole process of the bladder, it's really quite a simple organ in some respects. It only has really two functions. One is to store urine and the other is to empty urine. And we like to uh, put it in these, these simplified categories so that we can address the issues and the problems in a, in a more direct way. So the storage of urine, if it's a storage problem, it means that they can't, the bladder doesn't want to accommodate or hold the urine uh, very much. They're urinating too frequently, they have too much urgency, they can't get to the bathroom in time. And uh, the, the, void, the emptying problem, the emptying phase, is where there has to be a coordinated function between the bladder and the sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles that when it's time to empty, the bladder contracts and the sphincter and the pelvic floor have to relax. <clears throat> the, the storage phase, of course, the bladder is relaxing and the pelvic floor and the sphincter are tightening. And there has to be this coordination between the bladder and the sphincter. Unfortunately, in MS patients, they have a unique issue where there's a lack of coordination between the bladder and the sphincter, and that's called dysenergia. And that complicates our management of the MS patient because it's, it's somewhat unique to this group. It's a very uncommon problem in the non-MS patient. So that's why we try to break it down into the storage phase, emptying phase, and why is there a problem with that. So the MS patients not only have problems with the storage phase, they can also have an emptying phase, they can also have a combination of both, where the bladder doesn't want to store very well and it doesn't want to empty well. And that complicates our lives, even in your lives, even more, I'm afraid. So when we talk about overactive bladder, we talk about the urinary frequency and urgency. Typically, we speak of patients that are urinating more than seven times a day. If you're urinating eight times a day or urinating more than every two to three hours, we consider that too frequent. If it happens at night, we feel that getting up more than twice at night is interfering with your sleep patterns, and that's a problem. So by the time you're getting up three times at night, we call it nocturia. There's also the underactive bladder. To complicate things further, the MS patients can have a bladder that doesn't squeeze very well. The bladder is a muscle, and as a muscle, it has to push. So if the, the MS bladder is not uh, pushing well, it's an underactive bladder, and that can, go on lead on, that can go on to lead to retention. I talked a little bit already about the detrusor sphincter dysenergia, which is the lack of coordination between the bladder and the sphincter where they aren't talking to each other and they're not working together, where sometimes the bladder will try to squeeze and push the urine out, but the sphincter hasn't relaxed. So the bladder is working against a closed outlet. Over time, this will do damage to the bladder. The bladder is supposed to be a, a very pliable, very compliant muscle that should be able to stretch and, and, and hold urine up to about four to 500 cc's, four to 500 milliliters, and then be able to contract. 
when the bladder has to work overtime to push the urine out and gets, the muscle gets replaced by scar tissue and it gets fibrotic, you end up with decreased bladder compliance. The bladder loses its ability to, to, um, to be elastic. It loses that elasticity and that interferes with both the storage and the emptying phases. When patients start to have problems with uh, emptying, they develop high post-void residuals, meaning that they've tried to empty, they think they're empty, but they actually are leaving the bathroom with a large residual left behind. This can go on to lead to urinary tract infections and bladder stones. And then if a bladder is trying to empty and it's, it's not able to empty because of a bladder outlet obstruction, that develops high bladder pressures, high intrafascicular bladder pressures. Those pressures theoretically can be transmitted up to the kidney and do damage to the kidney with the high pressure. And that's where we start to develop renal failure from the chronic high pressure. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl going to the bathroom? Because the pee is silent. So, urinary frequency urgency, we, we spoke about the overactive bladder. There's also the bladder that squeezes without the patient's permission, and that's called urge incontinence. There's basically, basically there's two types of urinary incontinence. Incontinence meaning the, the leakage of urine. And this is a, another major problem for the MS patient. So there's two major types of incontinence. The first is the urge incontinence, where the bladder squeezes without the owner's permission. And, or, and it's a, sort of a legal term, the bladder contracts without the owner's permission. The stress incontinence is not the stress of a bad day. The stress incontinence is a mechanical stress where the sphincter, the valve, is not competent. It's not holding the urine properly. And the sphincter lets go or is not strong enough to hold the urine in, and the urine leaks out. These patients typically leak with coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting, straining, bearing down, jumping or running. Whatever pressure occurs in the abdomen gets transmitted to the bladder, and the sphincter is not competent or able to hold the urine in and the urine leaks out. But the, the urge incontinence is where the bladder is contracting. The stress incontinence is where the bladder is basically quiet. There's no increase in pressure in the bladder for the most part, but then the, the urine leaks out. And then there's uh, the type of incontinence that can occur with overflow where the bladder is stretched to its maximum capacity and more urine is being made and it just kind of overflows. And those patients usually have poor sensation of their bladder and it just kind of leaks out uh, as an overflow. There's also the incomplete bladder emptying where the patient tries to empty on their own. They really aren't effectively getting full use of their bladder. So they have urinary frequency and urgency because they're leaving the bathroom and their bladder is still partially full. So it doesn't take long before the bladder fills again and they have to urinate again frequently. Urinary retention can happen because of the underactive bladder, because it's a weak muscle, it can't push well. It can happen because of a blockage either due to the sphincter not relaxing or in a male patient it can happen because of a prostate. So in the male population we're challenged also to try to figure out how much of the problem is related to their MS and how much is related to their prostate. In males also it's, it's possible for them to develop a stricture which is a urethral scar uh, and uh, that's another type of bladder outlet obstruction. And then, as I mentioned, there's overflow incontinence from the, the uh, retention and partial emptying of the bladder. Detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, again, that term keeps popping up because of it being somewhat unique to the MS patients where the bladder and the sphincter are not coordinated. And then the high post for residuals uh, are a problem. So, the most common problem that we see in the MS patients is the overactive bladder. It occurs in up to 90% of MS patients uh, with urinary symptoms. And a third of uh, patients with overactive bladder will also have this dyssynergia. So it's a large number of patients. Bladder areflexia is a bladder that is just a floppy sack. It's just a weak bladder to the point where it doesn't generate any pressure. Um, 
When we are looking at the bladder, the bladder is a muscle that should contract, but you also get some pressure in the bladder from the abdomen. It's an intra-abdominal organ, so patients are able to generate a little bit of pressure by squeezing their abdomen. Decreased bladder compliance, again, has to do with the, the lack of elasticity of the bladder. And it's, a, it's actually a, uh, we, we do testing on patients called urodynamics, where we challenge their bladder with water in the office in a sort of laboratory condition while they're hooked up to a computer. And we're measuring the changes in volume as we fill them slowly as we're measuring the pressure and the electrical activity of their pelvic floor. And so as we're doing this, we're sort of trying to recreate in the laboratory setting what is happening to them in real life as their bladder is filling and as they're trying to empty. So uh, uh, a non-compliant bladder is basically a, a, a mathematical formula of the change in volume over, excuse me, over the change in, in pressure. And again, the non-compliant bladder is the, is the non-elastic uh, uh, fibrotic bladder. So we talked about most of that already. This is an example of urodynamics. So there's six channels here. And uh, the way it works is that a catheter goes in the bladder and a catheter goes in the rectum. And the reason for that is we're measuring both the pressure in the bladder and the pressure in the abdomen. Because the pressure in the bladder is a combination of both the bladder pressure created by the bladder itself, but it's also the additional pressure from the abdomen. So what we do is we subtract the pressure from the abdomen from the pressure, total pressure in the bladder, and we end up with the, the pressures that are created by the bladder itself. I know it sounds bizarre, but it's, um, let me go back here one more. Can I, thank you. So the first channel is the total pressure in the bladder. The second channel is the pressure in the abdomen. The third channel is a subtracted pressure, which is a calculation uh, of the two, where you're subtracting the abdominal from the, the bladder. And this is true, supposedly the true pressure created by the bladder itself. And as you can see here, the bladder is making these increases in pressures in somewhat a rhythmic fashion. It's a pattern of the bladder uh, contracting uh, inappropriately uh, and, and these are detrusor hyperreflexia, these are uninhibited bladder contractions, these are increases in pressure that the patient will feel an urge and sometimes will be incontinent. Um, the, this channel is the urination flow, but obviously the patient is not leaking so there's no flow. Um, the, this is the volume of the flow. This is the electrical activity of the pelvic floor. So we're trying to see what is going on with the sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles. Are they contracting? And we measure that electrical activity with EMG pads on their bottom. And this is the volume that's being instilled in the bladder. As the, as, this is the filling phase of a urodynamics test. The next patient is showing uh, detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. And it's the same channels, but what you'll notice is this is, a, this is a flow study. This is where the patient actually is voiding. And so you see some volume coming out, and that's being measured. But most important is here, right here, these, uh, this electrical activity. For the most part, the pelvic floor is quiet, and the patient is, is uh, uh, filling, but when they contract, their, when the bladder contracts and tries to push the urine out, the sphincter and the pelvic floor increase their activity exactly opposite of what they should be doing. And so that is where the sphincter is closing up when it should be quiet, when it should be relaxing. Okay, so how do we manage these patients? Well. One of the issues, of course, with the MS patient is going to be that their disease process can change over time. So as we are managing MS patients, we want to be somewhat careful that we don't do anything that's irreversible. And uh, we want to, of course, manage them uh, to also rule out or include 
if they have, let's say, prostate issues, if they're a male, if they have overactive bladder, just for other reasons. Uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's multiple levels of managing MS patients that are challenging. Uh, we want them to be able to empty their bladder at a low pressure. We don't want them to have that high pressure voiding that can be transmitted to their kidneys and do kidney damage. We want them to be dry. We don't want them to be incontinent. We don't want them to leak urine. Uh, we want to preserve the upper tracts, the kidneys. And we want them to have good quality of life that they can control their bladder, that they're not chained to a bathroom, they're not chained to a toilet, they're not running back and forth uh, frequently. And uh, again, there's a variable course with all this, so it's important to uh, manage these patients over long term. The first thing is to do some lifestyle changes. So we tell them, well, if you're drinking before you go to bed, that fluid is going to be converted into urine while you're sleeping and it's going to get you up more frequently at night. So probably it's a good idea if you're having problems with getting up too frequently at night to stop drinking after dinner or slow down your fluid intake after dinner. And that's an easy thing to do. Drink during the day when it's easier to get up to go to the bathroom, but uh, at night, uh, slow it down. Caffeine is a, uh, is a diuretic. You actually make more urine from the caffeine, but in addition, it's a stimulant, and it stimulates the bladder. So caffeine intake is going to make, uh, uh, make you urinate more frequently. There are some other bladder irritants, particularly acidic uh, foods, alcohol, uh, spicy foods are sometimes an irritant to the bladder, but not for everybody. I, 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 I want to caution that uh, uh, not, everybody is, not everybody is diet sensitive. Uh, weight loss is a significant factor. The, the pressure on the bladder can be uh, decreased by losing that abdominal weight and uh, uh, bowel management. The bowel and the bladder live in the same neighborhood, so it's very important that they keep their bowels regular because the, the bowel and the uh, bladder affect each other. When a patient has severe constipation, they can go into urinary retention. So it's important to maintain good bowel regimen. And then, of course, there are medications that can affect the bladder, and uh, I'm not going to get into all that. It really depends on the medication. The other thing that we could try as conservative management is, is behavioral modification, uh, bladder training. It's somewhat effective, but uh, the patient could try to increase the time intervals uh, that they have to void. When they first get that urge, see if they can suppress it for about five minutes and do that for a week or two, and then the next time go to 10 minutes and slowly build up the capacity of the bladder. Uh, again, this is probably more appropriate in the non-MS patient, but it's sometimes a, a, po a possibility uh, for a, uh, a patient that has mild or early uh, MS. Timed voiding. Not everybody is set, uh, has sensation of the bladder. So rather than waiting to that last possible moment, there's a, uh, it's sometimes appropriate to use a clock to know when it is time to void in advance of having that, that urinary urgency or in that ur urgent continent episode. So some patients will urinate every two hours by the clock and try to avoid a problem in advance. And there are some exercises that can be done. There's biofeedback that makes these exercises more effective, where a, we have a, uh, a technician who puts like these EKG pads on your bottom. You watch a computer screen, and you, she tells you which line she wants you to uh, uh, move, that it's the red line or the blue line, because these are very non-intuitive muscles. These are not muscles that you're used to exercising. These are pelvic muscles. So it sometimes takes that biofeedback to identify which muscles we're talking about. Patients could sometimes identify the appropriate muscles that when they are urinating to try to stop the stream. Those are essentially the muscles we want you to exercise, but we don't want you to get into the habit that every time you urinate, you stop the stream. That's not actually good. So the idea is just to use that exercise to identify the muscles so that you can practice them when you're not voiding.
Uh, patients often forget when to do these exercises, so I try to tell them to use the cues of living to remember to do the exercises. When you're reading and you turn a page, you do your exercises. When you come to a stop while you're driving, do your exercises. When you're watching television and a commercial comes on, do your exercises. So you use the cues of living to remind you to do them. And there's a certain number you have to do. You have to do them 10 repetitions for 10 seconds each and so on. So when we have urinary urgency, we, uh, we try to use conservative management with fluid intake, uh, bladder training, um, uh, dietary measures, lose weight, pelvic floor muscle exercise, incontinence, sort of the same thing. And again, these are just a, a summary of some of the conservative ways to avoid uh, urinary problems. Most cases, we end up having to use medications. And one of the main groups of medications that we use for overactive bladder in both the MS and non-MS population are known as anticholinergic medications. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with a lot of these. Oxybutynin was the first one that we started to use. It was specifically for the bladder. Uh, and uh, since then, we've come out with uh, second and third generation medications. Uh, the other medicines that are well known are Vesicare, Toviaz, Detrol, Trospium, Sanctura. Uh, Amipramine is actually uh, L is, um, um, a etophranil. It's a tricyclic antidepressant, but we use a tiny, tiny dose. And it's very interesting because it has multiple benefits that it can tighten the sphincter as well as calm the bladder. And we're using a dose that we would use in children. We use this medication in children that wet their beds. The other nice thing about amipramine is it's extremely inexpensive. The newest medication to come out is Merbitric. And Merbitric is in a separate category as the anticholinergics. So it doesn't have the same side effects as the other anticholinergics, which is dry mouth and constipation. Merbitric can raise your blood pressure a few points, but not very significant. And it's a, it's a really nice medicine because it uses a different receptor than the anticholinergics do. It's a, it's a beta agonist. Uh, so it, um, it, it's very interesting medication. It doesn't work with everybody, but at least we now have an alternative. And we're now even combining it with anticholinergics so that we can get additional benefit. Interstim, uh, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with Interstim, but it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, device that gets implanted. Uh, I've been putting Interstim in since it uh, came out in the late 1990s. So I have one of the largest series of Interstim. Um, it, when it first came out, it was not indicated for the MS patient. Uh, it was supposed to be for patients that had uh, overactive bladder and uh, had uh, non-obstructive uh, non urinary retention. But uh, over time, it ha they've increased the, the usage of Interstim for the MS patients. And it, it's, what it is basically, it's, a, uh, it's a, a pacemaker for the bladder. It, it, it should be thought of that way. It's more complicated than that. But what we do is we, we place this lead, this little uh, electrical uh, lead in their lower back. And we then uh, externally hook them up to a, uh, a an, uh, electrical stimulator. And we let them go home with that for about a week or two. And we see if their urinary symptoms improve. If they improve, we remove that external lead. And we go on to implant uh, a new lead underneath the skin. Uh, and we put the stimulator also in the upper buttock underneath the skin, in the fat. The battery lasts about five to seven years, and uh, the patient gets a home unit to control their bladder to adjust the stimulation. You don't have to use the home unit every time you want to urinate, but you find the level, and there's different programs you can use to see what is the best program and the right amount of voltage to stimulate the bladder to work appropriately. Now, this is used for the patient that has the overactive bladder that doesn't respond to medication so that they, their bladder calms down. So it's actually stimulating the inhibitory nerves for the bladder, which is kind of uh, uh, unusual to understand. Uh, 
There's also the interstim for the patient that has non-obstructive retention where they have a hypocontractile underactive bladder and it relaxes the sphincter, we believe, so that even a weak bladder can em empty more effectively. So it's an interesting process um, and uh, I've had mixed results with MS patients. I have a feeling that some of the MS patients work well initially, but over time, it might be due to their demyelination, but over time it seems to become less effective uh, as opposed to my general uh, population of patients. Uh, so, you know, it's something that to consider, but I, I do consider it sort of a, a late uh, treatment for the uh, MS bladder. We use Botox for patients that are, have intractable overactive bladder where the bladder is, is urinating, uh, uh, they're urinating too frequently and the medications aren't working or they're having too many side effects from the medicine. And we literally inject the bladder with Botox. Um, I was involved in the clinical research studies for Botox. I've been doing this for at least 12 years. It only got FDA approval about four years ago. You probably see some advertisements on television even, but it's very effective. And depending on how severe the problem is, we can use between 100 to 300 units of Botox. And it, it partially paralyzes the bladder. It's not meant to paralyze the bladder completely, but these patients then are able to store urine better. It does not help the patients that have urinary retention. Um, and it gets all the wrinkles out of the bladder at the same time. <laughs> we do try the pelvic floor muscle exercises and physical therapy. There are a number of physical therapists who specialize in pelvic rehabilitation. It's very important that you find a physical therapist that understands pelvic rehabilitation and specializes, especially trained in that. Most physical therapists uh, are not, and there's only a few of these uh, physical therapists uh, scattered about uh, Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties. And then for the urinary frequency, very rarely we'll use a hormone called DDAVP, which is really for children that wet their beds. And it's a hormone that slows up the production of urine temporarily. And it's a little tricky to use in adults because they can literally get uh, 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 low, uh, low, they get too much water in their system because it's working on the kidneys, not on the bladder. So it's really not something we like to do because it, it can change the electrolytes and so on. But in children, it's, it's, it's safe. Uh, for women that have incontinence due to a weak sphincter, we could do a uh, procedure that is called a sling. The sling is, does use a little bit of mesh, but it was not involved in any of the uh, cases that you see advertised on television. But it's a very effective, very safe procedure where we put a half inch strip of mesh underneath the bladder neck to prevent the sphincter from moving down and letting go. And it takes about 15 minutes. Uh, I've been doing, again, this since the late 90s without any complications or significant complications. And it's very effective for those patients that have stress and con as a weak sphincter. Other patients may choose to have a bulking agent, which is simply if their sphincter muscle is weak, if their sphincter muscle is weak and we go in through the urethra with our scope, we inject a, a bulking agent around the sphincter and tighten it up like a washer for a leaky faucet. And it doesn't last forever, but it can last several years. And again, it's for a specific type of urinary incontinence that comes from a weak sphincter. Uh, in males, uh, we can use uh, uh, an external condom catheter or a Foley catheter. we rather not. Um, and sometimes we'll use something called a Cunningham clamp, which is sort of like a clothespin on the penis. It's not comfortable and we, we don't like the idea and they have to remove it periodically, let the blood flow. But again, th these are extreme treatments and we only use it under certain circumstances. Functional incontinence is the patient that cannot get up from their wheelchair to, or the, from the bed to get to the bathroom on their own or to get on a commode on their own. And as a result, it's functional incontinence. It's not necessarily that their bladder is, is the problem, but their, their muscle weakness and their uh, ability to move is the problem. And the goal, of course, is to avoid diapers and pads because this leads to various problems, including urinary infection and skin breakdown, as well as the social complications uh, from uh, incontinence. 
When we have a hypocontractile bladder, a weak bladder, we could use something called an alpha blocker, such as Flomax, Rapaflow, Uroxitrol. Uh, these are medicines that relax the sphincter, and these are often used in men with enlarged prostate. They're very effective and have very little in the way of side effects. So occasionally we'll use this in females who don't have a prostate, but to help their sphincters to relax because of their MS. Some patients are not able to empty and they'll have to learn how to catheterize themselves. Uh, it's not such a big deal. I'm hoping that I'll get to my slide on that. I've got two minutes. I'm probably not going to get to that. Um, I mentioned interstim, and uh, as far as the indwelling catheters, that's our last resort. Whether it's a Foley catheter in the urethra or a suprapubic catheter, that ends up being necessary in about 30% of patients with uh, uh, urinary retention from MS. And it's, uh, it's, it, it, the suprapubic catheter is the preferred method uh, for both males and females. So this is uh, basically how we do self-intermittent catheterization. Uh, uh, it's not hard to do once you learn. Patients say it's sort of like brushing their teeth and it helps them to empty their bladder. Some patients have to do it four to six times a day. Others have to do it just before they go to bed. Um, and uh, it's, it's not hard to learn. Other related issues for MS patients have to do with urinary tract infection. Uh, there are ways to avoid recurrent urinary tract infection. I heard uh, the other speakers talking about probiotics. That is something that we recommend for females with recurrent infection because the bacteria in the vagina that are the good bacteria that are prevent, prevent infection are called lactobacillus, and they create lactic acid. They make the uh, vagina more acidic, and that is, uh, prevents the bad bacteria from getting access to the urinary tract. Vitamin C also acidifies the urine. Vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. It's also known as ascorbic acid. And by making the urine acidic, it helps prevent inf infection. Cranberry capsules will also work. Um, cranberry juice is mostly sugar water, so we suggest cranberry capsules, which are the cranberry fruit freeze-dried, crushed into a powder, and put into a capsule. And we tell patients to do these things twice a day because it passes through the urine rather quickly. Uh, if they have a, uh, a neuropathy from their MS and they have burning when they urinate, we suggest certain medications that numb the urinary tract. And if they have problems from chronic indwelling catheters, that the pressure from the catheter has damaged their sphincter, damaged their urethra, uh, we want to take care of that. Okay, so I'm getting the, uh, Stu is giving me the cutoff sign. Uh, so uh, I was uh, just going to go through uh, what some uh, uh, clinics in, uh, have done. And it's, it's, it's often the point, the point I wanted to make is that we often have to use a multimodal therapy. We often have to adjust our therapies. There's no set way to treat uh, MS patients in particular because they are more complicated than the general population and they're, they have the potential to change and, and there's different ways to skin a cat. So anyway, I guess that's uh, sort of the quick uh, uh, synopsis of what we talk about with uh, urological implications. I was going to talk about sexual dysfunction, but I didn't get that far. So there's no sexy time now. Um, I'm sorry. But that'll be the next talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry about that, everybody. You'll have to deal with your own sex another way. All right. Now, you know, I can't give him more time than I gave to Ramahan Steingo or Burks, right? So he's got the same amount of time. Sorry. That's okay. All right. All right. So what we're going to do again now, we have Michelle, raise your hand on the left side of the room, and we have Maria. I say left, that's my left. And Maria's on that side of the room. Okay, and we're gonna go around and we're gonna do Q&A for about 30 minutes, and that's it. Then afterwards, we're gonna have Jeff Siegel up here, and Jeff is gonna be here to speak with you about things to do with your spasticity and, um, and, and how to work through all of this. But before I say all this, what do you all think about the guys that set up all this equipment in here? His name is Bill. And Bill is with Orlando Production. And Bill's been working with me now for about two years. And when we do programs in Indianapolis, Chicago, uh, we've been in uh, Louisville, uh, a lot of different places. We're, you know, we're doing programs now in 10 states. 
they drive all this stuff wherever we are at, and they set up at all these programs, and so that's why I have to thank Bill as well. Thank you, Bill. And Kevin, and Kevin. All right, who's got the first question? Anyone on that side of the room? Well, we got one down here, but I've got, I've got email ones all, or text messages as well. Anybody on that side of the room, raise your hand so Maria can see who you are, okay? The first question that I'm gonna ask, because somebody asked on the internet, is what do they do for, how much drinking can they do at night? When is their cutoff time? Because they find themselves running too much during the night. I generally tell my patients that after dinner, they should start slowing down their fluid intake. Uh, what's recommended for patients is eight glasses of water a day. Quite frankly, if I drank that much, I'd probably be drinking and peeing all day. So I personally can't seem to do that. But uh, that's what's technically recommended. Uh, you do get a lot of water from your food, and that was not included in some of those original studies where they suggested eight glasses a day. But after dinner, I tell my patients, start slowing down uh, and uh, drink only when you have to. You. In another MS Views and News program, people with MS were told not to take the vitamin C at all. If you have frequent bladder infections, urinary infections, what do you suggest that we take instead of the vitamin C? Okay. Um, the question is, is vitamin C. I was not really aware that vitamin C is, is, uh, 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 is not a good thing for MS patients, quite frankly. Um, my understanding of vitamin C is that it's one of the most benign uh, vitamins around uh, because most of it gets excreted by the kidneys. Um, and so any excess vitamin C gets eliminated right away. I tell my patients to go out and get the least expensive generic vitamin C they can find. We don't want time release. We don't want rose hips. We don't want ester C. We don't want emergency. The point is, is that you want the vitamin C that's going to pass through you quickly. Most vitamin C is designed to stay in the body. We don't even want it staying. We want it going straight into the urine. So um, I, I can't say that the vitamin C that I'm recommending for my patients is really harmful because it should pass through quickly. And vitamin C is an antioxidant. It's been, you know, it's one of these vitamins that has been extremely well studied. I didn't realize it's, it's contraindicated in MS patients. There's probably other ways of acidifying the urine, uh, but uh, I've always used vitamin C because it's the least expensive, easiest to obtain, and I thought the most benign. But then you can still do the cranberries, I suppose. Um, yes. Is there a way to go about strengthening the bladder? It's like a balloon. You know, it stretches out. Is there a way to make it where you can hold the urine? Uh, so the, the question is, can you strengthen the bladder so it can better hold the urine? Um, when we talk about weak bladders, it's almost, uh, it's almost the opposite. A bladder that is, is too strong is going to be an overactive bladder, is going to push the urine out. So um, if it's a storage problem, you don't want to strengthen the bladder, you want to relax the bladder. Um, but uh, again, it's more complicated than that, especially in males, because we're not sure if they're emptying completely and if, they're working, if their bladder is working against a closed outlet, and that has to do with the prostate and the dyssynergia and so on. So there's, in terms of strength in the bladder, no. There, there's a medicine that we sometimes will use called urocholine or bethanicol. It's not very effective. It makes the bladder contract. It's a cholinergic as opposed to being an anticholinergic. But it doesn't get absorbed very well, and it usually causes more GI problems than it does uh, help the bladder to contract. I've had um, MS for like 30 years, and I've had bladder infections for 30 years, and I've had to catheterize for 30 years, and um, so I have a chronic UTIs. Is there anything I can do about it? Um, I've always, no matter what I do, um, I'll, um, I try to drink like six glasses at least a day because I have, uh, since I have chronic infections, but um, uh, 
having to catheterize all day long is difficult too. What do you suggest for chronic UTI? So chronic UTI, recurring urinary tract infection, is a common problem for MS patients and, and for women for the most part, honestly, too. I, I have to say I see a lot of females who have unexplained recurring urinary tract infection, and we just have to manage their infections. We don't know the cause. We try to find the cause. Sometimes it's a bladder stone. Sometimes it's uh, an anatomic abnormality. I mean, we always want to rule out any causes of recurring urinary tract infection that are easily re reversible. But a number of our patients, have, female patients in particular, have recurrent infections with chronic UTI, and it's difficult to manage them. We don't like using too much antibiotics because over time they become resistant to antibiotics. So again, I try to use conservative management, which is the vitamin C, the cranberry, probiotics. I'll go through um, uh, other things that may promote infection. If they're using pads, that increases the, the bad bacteria uh, around the opening of the bladder. So we want to get them out of any kind of pads uh, and, and treat their incontinence. Um, we sometimes have to use an old-time medicine called methenamine. Methenamine is an antiseptic. It's not an antibiotic. It's what they used to use before they invented antibiotics. And it lowers the bacteria count. It doesn't cure the infection, but it lowers the bacteria count to the point where the patient doesn't notice the infection. And, and that's okay, too. Um, and so there's, uh, then there's some patients that have urinary infection and don't even know it. And they develop sort of a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria. And as long as the patient is not symptomatic and the bacteria is not bothering them, we'll let them have that bacteria growth in their urine because it's not causing problems. Um, we have to check your technique. You're doing self-intermittent catheterization. We have to make sure that your technique is good, that you're not introducing the bacteria. And we always want to know what the bacteria is that's growing because in, in some cases, it's the same bacteria that never gets eliminated. In other cases, every time they have a UTI, they have a new bacteria. And that means they're, re they're getting rid of their infection, but they're reintroducing a new infection. So there's a whole process that we go through, particularly involving uh, looking at the kidneys with an upper tract study, a renal ultrasound, and doing a cystoscopy to look in the bladder to make sure there's nothing going on in the bladder itself. Next question the person wanted to ask uh, is when they stand up at it, getting out of their car and they have pressure on the, uh, on the bladder, is that caused by some kind of, uh, I lost it in my phone because my, my phone is almost dead, but um, is there some kind of, who asked the question? Somebody here asked the question. What's the question? Getting out of your car and having that urge. Is that what it stress is? Stress inconsistency or something like stress that? Stress incontinence? It's stress incontinence. There we go. Wrong, wrong I word. Well, uh, it sounds like the question is that when they get out of their car, they either have a strong urge to urinate and they probably can't get to the bathroom in time or they actually leak at that moment that the, they're moving and they get out of the car. Again, this is where we have to determine is this a urge incontinence or a stress incontinence? And, you know, there are triggers that affect the bladder. I mean, the bladder and the brain have a very strong mind-body connection where the sound of running water, a cold chill, will give you that urge to urinate. Uh, and some of the times it just has to be getting out of the car or putting the key in the door. We call it the key in the door syndrome, trying to get inside the house. Uh, there's also the foot on the floor syndrome. When you get out of bed and your feet hit that cold floor, you can't get to the bathroom from your bed to the bathroom. So there are certain triggers for the bladder, and those are uh, treated with medications usually for overactive bladder because it's not only happening under those circumstances, it's happening under other circumstances as well. If it's a stress incontinence it's because the, it's the movement of getting out of the car, then they leak also probably with coughing or sneezing, and then we would put in a sling and that would cure their problem. Yeah, um, I don't have any problem urinating during the day, but it seems like at night, um, I just seem to avoid very small amounts six or seven times a night. And I, I wonder why is it different at night than the daytime? 
So the question has to do with the nighttime frequency versus daytime frequency. And, and the truth of the matter is there are multiple factors. This is nighttime frequency, nocturia, is fairly complicated. Uh, there are certain hormones that you release at night that you actually literally make more urine at night. There's an antidiuretic hormone uh, that, is, is not re uh, th that is released that will allow you to make more urine. So uh, also another factor is that throughout the day as we're standing and sitting, gravity is pulling fluid to the lower part of our body. And you may not notice it, but some people will get some swelling of their ankles and their lower extremities. And that's fluid that's sort of being stored in their body. And then when they fly down at night, they put their legs up, that fluid shifts back into their bodies. Their kidneys literally make more urine. So it's not just the, the overactivity. It's sometimes uh, other factors. They, if we measure their urine output, they literally make more urine at night. So... We don't want to start putting them on medications if we can, so we tell them to restrict their fluid at night. Or in some cases, if they're storing a lot of fluid in their lower extremities, sometime during the day we say, get your legs up, try to get that fluid out, and uh, see if you can urinate more during the day when it's convenient for you. Uh, and then again, in some cases, it is just the, they're being more aware of their bladder. You could be easily distracted during the day as you go through your activities, and you're not thinking about your bladder, but as you're falling asleep and you're, you're stay, trying to stay asleep, it comes to your consciousness and then you get up and have to go. I was wondering um, if probiotics like yogurt are good for the intestinal tract, might the same be true for instance kombucha be good for the urinary tract for clearing up UTIs and other urological infection? Yes, I, I, I had mentioned a little while ago that uh, when I do recommend probiotics, particularly in females, I recommend the probiotics that have lactobacillus. And I heard one of the speakers mention the same one for uh, MS patients. So what lactobacillus does is it, it creates lactic acid. And there's lactobacillus that normally live in the vagina, but in particularly as women get older and they have less estrogen, they're less of the, the cells that are the food source for the lactobacillus, so they have less lactobacillus in their vagina, and as a result, the, the acidity of the vagina goes down, and they have uh, more uh, bacteria that are pathogenic, and therefore they get more likely urinary tract infection. So probiotics, possibly, it's not a, 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 there haven't been enough good studies to show, but I do believe probiotics can help prevent urinary tract infection in females. Before I take the question over here, I just want to tell everybody, when you're filling out your seminar evaluation forms, just leave them on the table when you're finished, and we'll collect them later on. And just know it's two-sided for those that spoke earlier and those that are speaking this afternoon. So I have a question over here for you. Um, what is the, the normal pH level of the, va the vaginal area and the urine, and how can that normal range be established within the body? Like acid or, P, you know, acidic or basic pH levels? Is that important to understand? Um, I'm not sure it's important for the patient to understand. You're not going to be monitoring your urine pH. That's not going to be useful for you. Uh, there, throughout the day, the pH does change somewhat, depending on what you eat. Um, but for the most part, the pH of the urine is around 5.5, if that helps you. I mean, that's, that's a pretty normal. You eliminate acid from your body through your urine. Your body's mostly alkaline. You're, the blood levels for the, uh, the pH blood levels is around 7.41, and it can vary very much. So the urine is more acidic. It's got a pH of 5.5 or so. So you're eliminating acid through the urine, as well as breathing out carbon dioxide. That's how we eliminate acid from our body and maintain that basic alkaline uh, blood pH. Thank you. Next over there in the center. Hi, thank you very much. Um, is there any particular area in the central nervous system that has MS involvement that would increase the probability of bladder issues? That's a real good question. Uh, is there any place in the nervous system that uh, MS affects, that affects the bladder issue? Of course, uh, 
you know, MS uh, affects several parts of the central nervous system, and uh, unfortunately, these are a lot of the same areas that affect the bladder. Uh, and uh, it could be, any, and because the, the bladder is this very, I, I, I don't want to blow my own horn, but I think the bladder is a very complicated organ. But uh, it, it's, there's so many levels of control in the bladder, from your, your conscious level to the unconscious levels, that uh, any one of those levels can be affected, uh, from the brain to the spinal cord to the pelvic nerves, and any of those can get uh, affected by MS. And, and affect the bladder. And that is the reason why there's such a variability in managing MS patients for their bladders because it, it depends on their, n the nature of their disease and, and so any levels can be affected. It's, it's, it has to be tailored to the individual patient, really. We have time just for two more questions. Somebody have one back there? Maria, this person right here, hand is up. Do you believe in long-term antibiotics to prevent the UTIs? I'm talking maybe two or three years or more. The question is, do I believe in long-term antibiotics two to three years or more to prevent UTIs? That is absolutely my last resort. Uh, there's, there's problems being on chronic u antibiotics. First of all, they stop working. Uh, they, the bacteria become resistant. So that is why my go-to is methenamine, which is an antiseptic. It's been around since the 1920s, I believe. So it's an old-time medicine that we have a lot of experience. What's interesting is that a lot of the insurance companies don't want to cover it, uh, which is kind of bizarre because it's an old-time medicine that is very safe for the most part. But um, uh, long-term antibiotics, I think, have problems, particularly certain antibiotics like nitrofurantoin, macrodantin. Uh, it can lead to pulmonary fibrosis, um, you know, and, and, and in some cases, I've had patients develop this. So I don't like using long-term antibiotics. I'd much rather use anything else but, but in some cases, it's a, it's a necessity because if the patient is getting sick and getting hospitalized, we have to use uh, long-term antibiotics uh, to prevent that. Any other question? I don't see any other question. Oh, we got one way in the back there. I'm assuming if there's no questions, you're all experts now in, in uh, bladder dysfunction. And, uh. I hope so. Um, my question is basically, you're talking about incontinence and so forth, but what about the frequent feelings of you have to go, but you really don't have to go, like you've just gone to the bathroom and you get, you get ready to walk out the door, you're like, oh, I feel like I have to go, and then you go sit down and you know you emptied your bladder, but you're constantly feeling, is that a spasticity issue or a bladder issue, or is it a urethral or neurolo neurologic? So you, the last question had to be one of the most difficult to answer. <laughs> Um, that has to do with urgency, and that's something that we in urology are still trying to figure out because we don't have a, a, a hard test to demonstrate urgency. You know, one person's sensation is different than another person's sensation, and, but urgency is a, is a real problem. And it, it, for the most part, it's your bladder lying to you. Your bladder is sending your brain a false signal that you have to go when you probably don't really have to go. And the bladder is a very stupid organ. It only knows two things, full and empty. So it's telling your brain you're full when you know you're not full because you just left the bathroom. So something may be stimulating your bladder. Uh, that's why, you know, when people have urinary tract infections, they're urinating frequently. It's the inflammation and irritation. So it's a complicated answer to that. And sometimes these patients don't really empty. They are leaving urine behind, and they're walking out with a half-full bladder, but that's probably not the case in your situation. But it's, it's a complicated issue as the sensation of having to go and what is causing that and how to control that. Again, we usually go to the medications, the anticholinergics and merbetric to control the over active bladder urge. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we got to have Dr. Samowitz. He's got his plaque to be here today. Thank you very much. All right, next one up. 
I know a lot of you have heard Jeff before, and I know there's many people excited to see him, especially the women out there, right? You all do this to me all the time. But anyway, Jeff is getting ready to come on up. He's, he's going to run around this place and make sure to help you out. But what I'm going to talk to you about is exercise and the recommendations of exercise and what you should and shouldn't do. And it basically boils down to what you do as a child. How many of you did not play as a child? Raise your hand. Ah, oh, you poor people. <laughs> so at, right now, what, what, when you're told to exercise, the word exercise becomes a scary phrase when a doctor says it to you because you don't really know you're here, you're supposed to exercise, but you don't know what to do. So don't think of it as exercise, just think of it as movement. Think of it as something different because we are built to move, right? We're here to move. On Earth, that's what we do. We move and we eat and we hopefully have fun. So exercise or playing, which is what we called it as a child, should be fun. So I want to, I want to raise a, see you raise a hand of every person that remembers what it was like the day before or even further back of your diagnosis of MS. Raise your hand if you remember. Have any of you ever who've raised your hand now. Any of you changed your name, your first name since your diagnosis? Any, if you have, raise your hand. There might be one person, there's a lot of people here. Okay, so you're the same person you were the day before you were diagnosed. So that doesn't change. And what you need to know is that you're not gonna change who you are. You know, whether it be MS, whether it be something else, you wanna be that person that you've lived your whole life being, and the, it's really scary thinking that you may not be but the good news is, you'll always be that person. Each and every one of you are a one of a kind. Right? Everyone who has MS may be a little bit different with their symptoms and whatnot, and what they can and can't do. But what I'm gonna do is, I wanna to prove to you that you are able to do more than you think. And that all the time that you've put in each week thinking about exercising, I want that to be actually time that you are exercising. Because if you exercised half as much as you thought about exercising, we all probably wouldn't have to be here today, right? Think about how much energy goes into thinking about doing something that you don't do, and then how much you dwell on it when you realize you haven't done it, and you look back and the best you can do is say, I tried. That's not good enough. If you can't do something, then change it. If you have an arm that works better than the other arm, obviously the other arm is gonna be your go-to, but you still move that arm. And if the arm doesn't work at all, don't focus all your attention on what you can't do, focus your attention on what you are able to do. Because if you do that, you may be able to do what you're able to do better, and then other people will notice it. And if you're a caregiver, any caregivers in here? How many of you caregivers tell the people who you take care of that they should exercise more? You don't need to raise your hand for this question, but how many of you guys exercise? <laughs> if you don't, and you're telling someone else to do it, Start, and the only way to change the future is by starting right now, right? You want the future to be better? You gotta start making the future better from here forward. You don't say tomorrow, the next year, or the first of the year on Monday, because whether it be diet or exercise, what's the best day of the week or the most common day of the week that people start a new routine? Monday. Monday. That would leave Tuesday or Wednesday for the most common day for them to end that routine, <laughs> right? And you know what the worst part about it is? The weekend leading up to the Monday, is when you're gonna probably do the worst things for yourself, thinking that Monday the world's gonna change. So most people who go on a diet or start an exercise routine on a Monday and fail, they'll put more weight on and consume more calories the weekend before starting the diet than they will burn from the day and a half they actually stay on the diet. And to me, when it comes to, you know, there's no research that specifically says this diet is the MS diet. We know that. I'm sure that I wasn't in here for the Q&A, but did diet come up at all in the last, with the, with the physicians here? Yeah. You know, did, they, did they say that? I don't want to contradict them. I, I can tell you that if you eat healthy, you're going to be healthier. Yeah. You know, that's logic, right? If you eat poorly and you're sick, do you think that's going to help your MS? No. So it's a no-brainer. You know, the healthier you eat, the healthier you are because what you put in is what you have to work with. So when I'm, I'm a personal trainer, that's, you guys see it on the paper, I was, I've been doing this for years prior to me being diagnosed with MS, which was in 1998, and there was a time I couldn't stand, I couldn't talk, and I couldn't see all at the same time. 
It, it was a really blank period of my life. <laughs> but um, today I'm able to do everything that I ever was able to do. And if I ask everybody in here who does exercise, I don't like to say it because then they look around and people will see that some people's hands aren't raised. So I'm not going to call you out. But um, the biggest question or the biggest answer that comes up to me, people will tell me what they used to be able to do. How many of you who, that don't exercise are thinking about what you were able to do at one point in your life? Anybody? Okay, and when you're thinking about it, are you thinking about how you were your very best ever? Most people think that way. So I'll ask people if it's a small group and we're having a, more of an intimate discussion about exercise and movement and stuff, and I say, what do you do and where have you been? How much exercise do you do per week? I always get the question if someone says, well, I used to be able to, and before they can finish saying it, I say, well, are you gonna tell me where you were at your very best? Because if you are, I can tell you I used to be this tall. Right? That's my answer to every time is, I used to be this tall, you used to be able to, whatever it is gonna be, but for you, in order to get to where you were at your very best, you had to work your tail off, right? It takes a lot of work to get to your very best. So when you think back about it, don't just think of the outcome, think about what it got, what, what you had to put into it, all right? So my discussion today is basically, if I had to tell you there's one thing to take home, it's to do whatever you're able to do and do it the best you can do it today. And saving energy, how many of you try to save energy for things? You know what that's called? We save energy and we call, in, in the world of science, it's called fat, right? Because saved energy means you're not using it and it turns to fat. So if you're saving energy for, for an event or for something coming up, make sure that you're gonna do it. You know, because if you don't do it, whatever you saved, you know, you're going to have twice the work to get rid of it. So what I want to do here is, I got all kinds of equipment up here, from light to heavy. I got some things I'm going to give away. Um, but I want to show you that if you can't do it the traditional way or how you once did it, I want to show you how you can do it today. So I'll ask for some volunteers. And again, how many people have seen me speak before? I'm a, I'm a, if you've seen me speak, you're not included in, in, in what I'm going to ask you. If you haven't heard me speak, I'm going to throw something out there just to prove something to you guys. Everyone else, don't give it away. But if you want to volunteer right now, all I ask is that you give 100%. You in? Okay, so if you're one of those few people, raise your hand as high as you can possibly raise it. Okay, now let me see how high your hands are. All right, now raise your hand this much higher. How many were able to raise their hands a little bit higher? Okay, because what I asked you to do is give 100%. And if this was 100% and I ask you to do this much higher, what are you doing? More than 100%? I don't think there's such a thing. But we work for, on incentives. Now everybody can be part of this. Our incentives are what we enjoy or what we want to get out of something. And if we do it, we get rewarded. So if I had $10,000 in my pocket for the first person that could raise their hand two feet higher than that, someone's going to do it, right? So why didn't you do it? See, there's a person standing on the chair. He's the, he gets a million dollars. So what I'm telling you is, just because it seems like you're doing 100% doesn't mean you're taking the right angle. You might have something else that you can do. And if you don't do it, it's stored as fat. Think about it that way. That may, may give you a little bit more incentive. But for me, incentives are happiness and being able to uh, just maintain my life as a trainer and, and be able to carry all this equipment in and out of people's houses and enjoy it. I love doing it. There's not a day of work that goes by that I don't consider to be fun and, and it, part, just enjoyment. So you know what they say, if, it, you know, if you really enjoy your job that much, it's not a job, it's not really work. It's still work, but we all want to have fun, right, at the end of the day. Uh, and I got a couple things with me that are as props, but let me see. One of the most important things about exercising is warming up. Now, this is kind of a trick question, but what's the most important or the best exercise to do for people who have MS? Stretching. Stretching. Anything else? Starting. The most important thing is what you're willing to do. Because if you're not willing to do it, it's not going to happen. And no matter, it doesn't matter how important it is. Or in a workout, what's the most important thing? The very first thing you do because you can't get to the second thing without doing the first. So you gotta want it, you know? I want you guys to want it. I want you guys to feel like there's more out there, you wanna get it, and then you gotta act and do it. 
Uh, so what I start, how I start a program out is when I'm working with somebody as a, um, as a trainer, I like to ask them, what did you eat today? How have you been eating? Did you sleep well? And that's my whole fatigue series. Did you guys get a, a lesson on fatigue today? Well, I want to know why you're feeling fatigue if I get to your house. So I'll ask all those questions. How was your sleep last night? What did you eat today? What did you eat yesterday? Anything going on in your social uh, circle that might be throwing things off? When all else is, is crossed off, then it might be MS fatigue. And you work around it. You don't fight through it. So if, you, if you're too tired to do a resistance exercise program, you may, may be the right day to do stretching or something like that. And I can tell by looking at someone when I first start working with them if they're going to have a tough time with that bout, and I'll change it a little bit. And if I can't tell, they'll tell me right away. <laughs> so, all right, any volunteers that I've pre-picked? <laughs> um, I want you guys to make your way up here if you can. And I, and I really want some questions from you guys if you don't understand something that we're doing. But I'm gonna tell you that everybody I work with gives it their all when they're with me. And I don't like to assess how they're doing when they're with me. I wanna know what they're doing when they're not with me. So think about this, how many times, and I want you, a few of you just to throw your, your uh, just say it, how often do you exercise in a week? How many times? Three. Okay, three times, right? For how long in those three times? Two hours. Two hours? Okay, so let's say, if everybody worked out three times a week for two hours each time, that's six hours of working out, right? Right, I have my math still right? Wherever it is, it's, it's, so we're gonna go off of that six hours. There's 168 hours in a week, that leaves 162 hours left over. What are you gonna do with that time? That's what's gonna dictate where your weight gain and weight loss is. The exercise is gonna complement that, but what you do outside of your exercise program is as important as what you do in the program, because if you're sitting around the whole time, then the exercises aren't really that beneficial. You need to do it when you're not. All right. Let's see, well, we, the way we start out, I got one other person that was gonna come up here, but if you ended up coming up, you can. If not. Okay, you're over here. She's hidden behind that, that bright light. Uh, what do we start out with every time? Every, everybody does it, except, okay, I won't do the, the side. I'll show this part. I like to get everybody going just a little bit, of loosening up their hips, their back, their sides, that kind of stuff. Sometimes they make funny faces, we laugh. Sometimes they don't, we cry. No, we don't cry. We don't cry when we work out, right? We smile, we're happy. So, does any of you wanna sit on this while I get to the next thing so you guys can be seen? And, and you gotta flex your muscles, so. Uh, okay, so what I like to do is something called chops. Now, I like to use medicine balls mostly soft ones because if you drop them on drop them on your foot it won't hurt your foot i got one more bag to get here let's see you hold this one you hold this one i'll get one for you don't worry and if i'm boring you i'm going to call you up here Okay, let's see, what else do we got? Who wants this one? You picked it, you gotta use it now. All right, for chops. What I like to do with chops, and I don't remember who it was, somebody asked me this week in particular, why do I like to do chops? Because a chop is in, is in four different directions. So we're gonna go here and here. Now, if you're able to stand and do it, that's how you do it. Pivoting your feet, shoulders and hips square, back and forth this way, then I do back and forth this way. And what I'm doing is I'm warming up on all planes that I move in a regular basis. You know, that's how the human body moves, on those planes. Side to side, and pivot your feet. Don't stand too close to the edge of the stage. We don't practice that when we train. And then, and there's also up and down. So, any questions as of yet? Now, if you were to do a treadmill or a bike and you can't do those motions, you don't have to have any weight. You can, there we go. Someone had a question? If you don't have those bowls, what do you use? You get them. <laughs> you can use a water bottle. Or if you, eight pounds equals one gallon of water. 
So you can kind of judge it by that. I see it, whenever I see a gallon of water, I say, wow, that's eight pounds. You can use that. Is that true? I found an eight, uh, an eight pound jug of water in her closet, which is the same thing as this medicine ball. They have them at all the stores. You can go to Ross, Walmart, um, anywhere that has any kind of sporting goods usually has uh, the ball. This was like $8. I stop and get them. I'm a fanatic. Every time I see an exercise ball for sale that's soft, I buy them. All right, then what I have people do, based on, on them, let's see. Jill, you want to try something here? Okay. All right. Okay. Watch this. Okay, what I'm going to have her do, now we did chops. There's also something called walkouts that I like people doing, which is on a stage isn't the best thing to do. I'm going to have a chair for you. So, and I'm gonna, and you don't get a chair, but you're gonna be in the spotlight. Okay. So, if it was gonna be a doing something along the lines of a chair stand, what I would do with Jill, and I want you to see, um, she has some difficulty getting up sometimes, sometimes she doesn't. So what I'll do with her is, you're warmed up right now. She's been running around everywhere today, so I know she's warmed up. Riding, passing, doing everything. Okay, so I'll put my hands out here. Can you see her? So I want you to do your best to stand. Now, a month and a half ago, she was not able to do it without um, my hands. This week, what do we do, 10, 12? 10, 12, no help, no hands, nothing. She's allowed to use her knees. That's the only thing she can push off with. Can you see that? Now, you're, now, you're in the, now the pressure's on. Okay, so what I always tell her is, when you start doing something that's difficult or we're not sure where we're gonna go with it, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and see yourself do it first. Because if you see yourself do it, there's a much better chance of being able to do it. If you convince yourself you can't do it, we'll move on to something else before we even try. So, let's give it a shot. <laughs> okay, you see it? All right. There you go. All right. So. Now, then, if it, now if she wasn't as strong as she is today, what I would do is I'd put my hands like this, and now what I'm doing is I'm seeing how much she's using my hands to stand up. One more. Okay, now have a seat. Now you, what I would have her do, have a seat. Now these are like squats. It's the same form as a squat, it's standing and sitting. That's why squats are so important for function. I would have her do something like this, stand, Press, sit, stand, press, sit. So, so she's gonna do 400 of these for you guys right now. <laughs> All right, so that is her way of doing a squat. Then I'll have her do some other squats. And then you can come over here, pan straight in front of you. I want you to do three squats. See that, those are perfect squats. If, you, if you've got, stop. If you got a video of that, that's how you should uh, try to mirror when you're doing a squat for yourself. So, you know, what, I, what I've learned is if you teach someone how to do a squat, it takes about 10 attempts before they can get a squat down pat. If you teach them the wrong way, it could take 10,000 times to fix it. So you want to learn the right way. And that's what I have people do is when I see something's not 100% the way it should be, we're done. We'll go on to something else or we'll change what it is so that way we're doing it with the right form. So that's a squat, a stand. You can do it against a wall with the ball. Uh, and then we'd go on to something upper body. What I like to do is go upper body to lower body to upper body to lower body because you can get local fatigue, your arms get tired, let your arms rest, let your legs do the work. If it's a cardiovascular thing, we work on cardiovascular stuff until you're able to do both and go back upper, upper body, lower body. I really like to do upper body, push, lower body, upper body, pull. Because then your pushing muscles are gonna get a break while you're pulling and it allows you to get a better workout. So now as far as a push-up goes, um, let's see, who in here, I'll, we'll do a few different types of push-ups. You're on the spot here, look at you, you, see, you knew it. I want you to do two push-ups. Regular push-ups. Push and if you guys think because you're a woman, you have to do a girl push-up, then go back to the 50s. Look at that, pretty good, right? She's gonna probably do another 30, but I'm not gonna let her. 
because she needs to have energy for her workout this coming week. But now, for you, what I would have you do, get an exercise ball. Exercise and working out is all about uh, mechanical advantages. It's physics, you know, you have, if you have a, a, a lever arm that's longer, it's more difficult. The shorter the lever arm, the less difficult. So for her to do a push-up, now what I would have her do is a push-up there and my hand's right here just in case. And now let's, the next one, so let's pretend like you can't do one more and I'm gonna help you. It's just like a seesaw. Now look, just a little bit of a push would help her up. There, you can stop. It's okay, everybody's impressed. <laughs> All right, pretty good. Those can be done against a wall. They can be done, uh, with, there's bands that I'll show you. You can do the same motion with a band. And the thing about a band is when you're standing and you're doing a band press, it, you've got your feet as your ground base of support and your kinetic chain's going all the way to the floor and you're getting work from the floor up to wherever you're pushing from. So your whole body's getting a workout. Now if you can't, which she can do the band stuff, but I'm gonna show her what I would do for somebody who's unable to. It would be, this would be the same thing as a push-up. Push against my hands and push. And let it come, there we go, push. So what's keeping her up is her core. If she starts to do this and going back, then I know it's a little bit too much and I do that with a band, a band holding it from behind her. Or you can do, if you have one arm that's stronger than the other, I'd have you do one arm press, which would be like this. You let it go, there. Now what she's working is her upper body, her chest, and her arms, but in her lower body or her midsections, that's it, she's working her core, but because if you push with this, you need strong core muscles to prevent you from turning to the side. So you're actually working your rotational muscles in the absence of rotation. So if you have a bad back or something like that and you can't rotate, you can still work your rotational muscles absent the rotation. Any questions about that? guys are professionals already. All right. Now, as far as a pull goes, let's see what we can use for a pull. A band. Let me see if I got a shorter one. This will have to do. All right. Let's see. I'm going to show a few different variations of a, of a row. This is a row. It's a pull. Pulling is bringing something towards your body. It's working posterior muscles. So for you, let's see, palms up. It's going to bring more biceps into it. And now pull it. Now do a row. Yeah, you got to breathe. You know, no, no, I'm not getting advanced. That, that's later. That's a squat row. She's showing off. Uh, okay, so what she's doing right now is she's doing a row, it's working her biceps, it's working her upper back, but, you can stop, but what it's also doing is it's working the muscles in her lower back, absent extension. So she's not extending, but she's using her lower back muscles to prevent her from falling forward. And which it feels really good. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. You, keep your po you have to keep, make sure you keep your posture, too, because you have to. So now your turn. So for you, I'm going to get a little bit more advanced. Stand up. I'm just picking on you right now, too. What, now, what I like to do in an assessment is if I see somebody, I'm not saying that she does this, but if somebody was to do a single-legged squat, even if they're holding on to me, and I see their leg coming in, I'm seeing that they're having a difficult time keeping their leg out. That's just the, the basic uh, scenario. So what do you do? You work the muscles that, that turn the muscle, that turn the leg out. And I'm more interested in movements than particular muscles. I know what all the muscles are, but they have to work together to create a movement. So I would have her do what I call an archer, which is a row with, with uh, external rotation of the leg. Because external rotators do this. Now her foot that's still on the gr that's going to be planted on the ground is the one that's getting most of the work. You can do it from right there. I got. Okay, this is what an archer would look like. She's gonna do two alternating each way. So she's gonna go one, two, three, four, go. That's an archer. And what she's doing is she's working her external rotators of her leg. Do two more so they can see. And what it's also doing is it's making my lower back stronger. <laughs> Stop. And then for Jill, 
She's going to do a row, which she always says that's too easy, and I have to make it stronger, but full. But they don't know how hard this is. Yeah, she said it's easy. OK. So what she's doing is working her lower back so she doesn't fall forward. Now for another leg exercise. A leg exercise can be something as simple as taking something like this, put your foot on it. No, you can do it from the seated position. Because this is something you can do to warm up. And what I was going to tell you before and I didn't is if you plan on stretching before you work out, plan on warming up before you stretch. That'll get your muscles warm enough to actually stretch because muscles are like rubber bands. If you stick a rubber band in the refrigerator, you take it out, you stretch it, it's going to snap or it's going to get longer than it should be. So you don't want that to happen. So just in and out. Some people have difficulty with their hip flexors, so they're unable to do this motion here and back because their hip flexor is what's responsible for it. So for someone who's unable to do that, I would have them do this to get their legs warmed up or as a leg exercise. And for some people, that's very difficult. You know, for others, it's not. Uh, okay, now, so another leg exercise that I like to do with these, this is a furniture mover. Furniture mover, that's all it is. You can do use it for so, I, I take it out five times a session at least, right? How many times? I always have it out. It's like the karate kid, wax on, wax off. You can do that with this. You know what you're doing? Inter external rotation, internal rotation of the shoulder, build strong shoulders, don't have hurt shoulders, and you're better off. Um, so one thing that you can do is use this for a single-legged squat, something like that, because if you can do this, then eventually you might be able to do it without it, you know, and it'd be just a, a squat like that. And then if my leg were to go in or out, I could see which, what's weak, her internal rotators or external rotators. Also, what we can do is like a, a squat with your leg going out to the side with this. There you go. So that's, that's good. So that's something that, um, that's a great exercise to, fo to follow one of the push or the pull. You can even do one leg, a push, the, um, then the other leg, and then a pull, or do unilateral or bilateral movements. Uh, the other things that these are good for, well, you can do something, I mean, how many people are here really in advanced, do advanced exercises and feel MS is not in your way of doing it whatsoever? and you're just able to just do anything. Any of you in here? You gotta be, come on. Any caregivers that feel you're that way? Okay. Well, there's, there's many other things that I would do that might not be functional for the person who has MS, but if they're able to do it, I want them to be able to do everything to their full capacity. So I would have them do something like a push-up using this, which is, you know, you can either do it like that or to the side, but there's so many different levels of what you can do with these. Or like I was saying, the wax on, wax off. And this is good for somebody who is unable to walk, but can maintain posture on all fours. Doing something like this, and then this way, or putting it under your leg, and bringing it forward and back. It's easier than, than your hip flexor being your complete driver when it comes to that. Now I'm going to show you the other thing. Did I have any of you guys do the press with the band? A pre this is the same thing as a push-up, but a standing push-up like I was saying with your feet at your ground base of support. And believe me, they didn't start out doing them the way that you see them doing it. They worked their tails off to get to where they are. It's not, a, it's not something that you try once and all of a sudden you've mastered it. But there's always a progression that you can do. Face that way. Now, like, like the row would be working the lower back for stabilization. This is working your abs. These things can lock in a door so you don't even need a partner when you're doing it, but it's best to have a partner. Okay, ready? Go. Yeah, straight forward. See, now if I see her leaning too much, what I would do is say, stand up straight and I'd put a little bit less pressure to it. But she's working her abs out, she's working her shoulders, her chest, triceps. And I see everyone's eyes going back and forth, so you're getting an eye workout. Okay, that's good. <laughs> now, the other thing that you can do is alternate or 
I'll let you do this one. Stand that way. I'm going to give you one, this is a one arm press. So what she's going to do now is do the press. Now what, she's, what she has to do is she has to stabilize herself with her core muscles. So she's doing rotation with, in the absence of rotation. Can you feel your core? It's working her obliques, that's good. And it's working, um, it's working the same muscles that she would be doing, but I'd have to equal it out. So when we work out next week, we'll do two extra things with your left arm. Otherwise, otherwise I'll be walking around. Yeah, otherwise she'll be walking in circles. But the important thing is that I've learned as in practice and in research is that if something is working, make it work better. If something is not working, make what's working work better. You know, don't waste time on something that's impossible. If somebody cannot move their right leg whatsoever, is it going to do you a lot of good to look at your right leg and tell it to move for six hours? Or is it better to concentrate on doing what you can and letting the doctors handle what you can't? That's, what I, that's my message to you guys is talk to your physicians about those things. And also, I did not say this at the beginning, which is like a, you know, a bad thing, but before starting any kind of exercise routine, it's important that you consult with your physician. Make sure that you are able to do it and that you have his okay or her okay. But I don't think there's too many doctors out there that tell people not to exercise if they're able to exercise unless there's something seriously preventing them from it. You had a question? Yeah. You mean if you don't have someone to observe, is there any way to know if you're doing it wrong? Or to, you know, to develop a well, you can pick exercises out. Remember, for every push, you should do a pull. And then that kind of equals everything out. But the, a good thing to do is to videotape what you're doing. Then you can see it versus what a picture of the right form is. And then you can kind of assess if you're doing it correctly, if you're all by yourself. That's the best bet when it comes to that. And also, not to use too much free weights, use more stuff like bands so that you don't get hurt if you're by yourself. Those are just um, important things to do. But again, I'm gonna go back to doing what you can and doing it at 100% today. Because whatever is 100% today, that's all you got. Tomorrow's 100% might be more, it might be less, but it's still 100% and that's the best you can do. So you, what you wanna do is you wanna be the very best that you can be right now all the time. What do you, what do you, what do you secure it with? Well, you know, because uh, all those uh, exercises that you did with the band. Okay, I'll show you. That was like a, I, I set you up for that. You were the person, I was waiting for that person that was going to ask. Okay. See this little part right here on, the, on this particular band? If a door can close and has a door jam, what you do is you close the door on this. I don't, there's not a door real close to show you. But you, when, the, when this is on the other side of the door jam, this piece here opens up a little bit and it's secure. So you can put it low, you can put it high, but as long as the door is closed, now you have the bands coming out and you can hold it and you can do presses, pulls, walks against it. And that's another thing I have some people do is just hold the bands and try to walk back a little bit as far as they can and walk forward. So they're getting a good lower back workout and a leg workout. Or lay down and do them. You guys got any of your favorite exercises that you want to, that you think is important? Huh? Okay, we'll get, we'll get to that soon. Here's another thing that you can do. All right, first thing, we, you heard from the urologist, you heard from the neurologists, and I'm going to ho hopefully, I wasn't able to hear what they were saying, but reinforce what they told you at some point is to stay hydrated. Do they talk about hydration? Okay, what's the most important thing is in your body? What are you mostly made of is water. So if you don't drink enough water and you're only drinking beer, <laughs> then you wouldn't be here anymore. <laughs> but drink water throughout the day. How many of you sit behind a computer or lay in bed and play on your phone or sit down and play on your phone for more than two hours without getting up? If I don't see any more hands, I'm gonna call out a bunch of liars. All right, you know what that says about you? You're dehydrated. How do I know? 
Because if you weren't, you would have gotten up to use the restroom. Okay? That's a very important thing that you continually think about, that if you don't want to sit too long, drink more. You'll have to get up or move on and go to the bathroom. It's good to do that. Another thing that I like to do is, let's see, where did I put it? How many people do we have here that are cooks, not chefs? Cooks. Okay, you guys cook at home. All right, so you guys have stuff like a rolling pin, I would think, right? We'll put that over here. Um, you guys use a timer, you just know when it's ready. If you have MS and you're like me, you gotta use a timer. Because I'll, I'll, I'll look at the clock 10 times and say, I'm gonna remember, it's 347. I look back at the clock, it's 352. What was that time it was? And I'll say it 10 times in a row, but then I gotta go think about something else and I lose my concentration. And So having something like this in the kitchen yeah. is important. So you know when, when you're about to burn something or when something's not gonna be about to burn. You know where else this is good? Wherever you are, because if you set this for 30 minutes, it's not hard to do. When it buzzes, what it means is get up. If you can get up every time this thing buzzes, you've gotten up plenty more times than you're gonna get up on a regular day. And that can be a regular day. Then when you get up, it's up to you to, to figure out what it is you're gonna do. And if you can't stand up, then you should do something like raise your arms. If you can raise your arms, raise them. If you can't, find something else that you can do. But every 30 minutes, now sometimes we're so tired and we got so much issues going on that in 30 minutes when that buzzes, you're like, oh, I can't do it right now. That's okay, set it for 30 minutes, you get another shot, right? And if you keep doing it all day, eventually you're gonna do it. But if you just write it down or you just think I'm gonna get up every 30 minutes, you're gonna lose track of time and it's gonna be three hours, you're gonna be dehydrated and you're not gonna need this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this for 10 minutes, hoping that I have 10 minutes of material to talk about. I can talk for like 10 days but I'd have like zero people left here other than the police. So when this buzzes, what I want you guys to do if you feel up to it, is if you're able to stand, I want you to stand up. Okay, you don't have to do it. If you're unable to stand, I want you to raise your arms up. And then when you sit back down or put your arms back down, I want everybody to clap because you did a great job and you did more than what you would have done if someone else was standing up here speaking, right? All right, and Let's see, I'm gonna put this up here. See, I, I really have more stuff to do when I work out, I just can't think of it. Can you guys think of anything else that we do? <laughs> I'm just kidding. A question. Do you do any balance activities? Yes, everything that you saw them do up here is, is based on balance. So something like, I don't like putting an unstable surface for somebody who has problems with, uh, standing on a stable surface, but as they're able to stand better on, an uns on a stable surface, I might add it for the fun factor and for a little bit of proprioception, which is your body's ability to know where you are in space, which we lack a little bit as people with um, neurological disorders. So our nerves don't really let us do it all the time, but we can learn about it. We're gonna do that, don't worry. Don't worry, we'll get to that. Okay. Doing any weights? Yeah, I'm gonna get some weights. I don't know where oh, I put them over here. Has anybody learned anything new today? Yes. What? No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to tell me. What you're doing. So what I what I like to have is this is a free weight. It's not always the best thing for everybody because if you drop it, you can hurt yourself with it. But that's 30 pounds. You can switch it and move it around from 5, 10, 15, 20. So everything that you just did, such as a press, I'll show you two other ways that you can do a press. Why is it 30? I didn't make it. <laughs> no, I'm just saying this goes up to 30 pounds and it, and it can go up in increments of five. So I can put it down to five pounds. So let me see that. Can you grab me that ball, please? The big one, the one to your right. So anytime you do an exercise that's unilateral, one side, like if I was to do this, 
I'm working my core to prevent me from doing this. Now, this could be a weight bench, or it could be something else that I'll show you in a second, but so you can do a bench press, which is similar to what they were doing with the press. A bench press is just coming up like that. Some people aren't stable enough to sit on a, to do it on a ball like that, so I'd have them do it on a half ball with more surface area, which would look like this. So now you have a little bit more stability. And if you can't do it on that, then you do it on a bench. And if you can't do it on a bench, I'd use the bands. These are fun because, anybody know what that's called? Come on. Nobody's got the real name for it? Yeah. What? Who said Bosu Ball? All right, come here, you get an, you get a, an award for that. You get your own timer, so whoever's with you and this timer goes off is going to have to stand too. I'm going to throw it to you. Can you catch? If not, if not, someone will pick it up for you. All right, round of applause. You got the answer right. The reason this is called a Bosu ball is because both sides up. What's it called? Bosu, B-O-S-U. So you can actually do stuff like stand on this. You don't have to do it. You want to? You can, come on up. Okay, now what, what's happening is, if I was gonna have her do squats on there, hold on, what, her prime movers take a, a step back and her stabilizing muscles end up working. So what happens when your stabilizing muscles work, which aren't the strongest muscles, your legs will shake because they're fatigued, squat. Keep your legs a little further apart. Now, try to do it without holding on as hard. Squat down low. You see her legs shaking? And if they're not, it's because she's a pro. Okay. You can step down. That's what you think. <laughs> so that's something I like to do. It's more of a fun thing, but it has its place. Uh, you can do it on this, you can do it on one leg eventually if you get to it. You wanted to know about balance, that's like supreme balance is doing stuff on here. Other things for balance is just, okay, first off, what's more important, balance or stability? Stability. If you can't stand like this, I would not expect you to stand like this, right, because it's a wider base of support. Difference between balance and stability is the difference between a triangle being placed down this way or this way. This way is very difficult. Um, now, what I was showing you guys before, did I, did I say anything about this? No. Okay. Are you wondering about it? This is what should be under everybody's desk. We would have much lighter Americans. But what it, what it can do is, I'll do it on this, which isn't very easy, but my chairs are taken. You just ride it. Never on a ball like this, though. Don't do it at home. But if you, and you can set it for a harder uh, resistance. I also have one of these that you can plug in, so if you have difficulty doing it, it can, it can jump start you, and then you can get going and unplug it. As a matter of fact, I've had several people that I've used it with where I plugged it in, and they get going, and after a while, I'll unplug it without them knowing, and then, I'll, uh, and then they'll ask me, well, can you make it slow down a little bit? So I turn the knob to slow it down. That's much better, they tell me. <laughs> or I've had people do it for a long period of time where I take it out and I pretend to plug it in and I put their feet, I say, let's, let's go, I'm gonna turn it up. I turn it up and they start pedaling faster. So the, the mind is, is very strong and if, and if you follow it, I mean, you can do a lot more than what you think. Okay. Now some other fun stuff that I like to do. How are we gonna do this one? You tell me. You wanna use eight pound, six pound, four pound, three pound, two pound, one pound, 12 pound, six? Okay, I don't have that one. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to, uh, let's see. It's gonna have to be eight. 
Who wants to be the first guinea pig? You? You're like, yeah, I'm a guinea pig. Here. This is what I like doing. Okay, so what she's going to do is she's going to throw it high. I'm going to throw it low. And we're just going to laugh. Go. <laughs> Got to throw it higher. She, I said, she's going to throw it high. I'm going to throw it low. The importance is to watch the ball that's being thrown to you or else you'll drop it. Now, everyone smiles when they do this, but until I start doing that, right? Right. So now she's working her core. She's working on balance. Now, what I would say is now let's do it on one leg. Right? And if you have to put your foot down, you put it down. Otherwise, keep going. So what I'm doing is I'm watching. If she's starting to go this way, I help her out and throw it this way a little bit. And she's smiling. Who else wants to do this? I'll, get, I'll show you what I do with these with her some of the time. Watch this. She's going to do a same thing. Now, this is, I'm, I'm giving it away. You always ask me, why am I? She'll ask me what every exercise is supposed to do for her. And I always say it's going to make you stronger. But I don't tell her the exact thing. But what she's going to do now is an explosive throw, which is a power movement with, for her shoulder muscles, for her delts. It's also going to help with her lower back. So what you're going to do is knock me off the stage. I throw it down the ground because I, don't, I want her to pick it up and throw it. Oops. Do I ever get mad if, you, if it doesn't get to me? Only if she breaks something in the house. Yeah. So what she's doing is and sit all the way up when you do it. Can you guys see her? There. OK, now. See, I could have used the, you, you said six, so I went to eight. That's just the way things work. Your turn. Now, one-handed throw. Move back, or else I'm going to be seated there. One-handed throw, one leg. One leg? One leg, one hand. Ready? Go. That's, that's what a really scared person looks like. Look at her face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on, one more time. It's fun, though, isn't it? OK. Uh-oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Why? Because Don't worry. Oh. OK, so something else that's similar to that. Balloons. Everybody, when I get the balloons out, everybody smiles when I'm using it with them. They think they're a kid again. I'll, I'm really close to singing happy birthday, but then we have to do an exercise. OK, I don't have emphysema. That's what I was checking on. All right. You guys hear that, right? All right. I would say 95% of the people in the room are standing or have their arms up. So I want a big round of applause for everybody for participating. OK, you guys can sit down. I'm going to show you a couple things with the, with the balloon that I like doing. That's fun. And then I'll have some questions and answers. And you can hear the other 12 hours of information I have to offer another time. OK, so what I'm going to do, this is a core exercise. Throwing the balloon, catching the balloon, and it also requires a lot of hand-eye coordination. And by the way, whoever asked about balance, that answer your question, you do balance. The closer your feet are together, the less stable you become. The more you're working your balance, the further your feet are apart, the more stable you are. Staggered stance would be the next thing, and then one leg over a long period of time. So watch this. Jill, just catch this. OK. It looks easy, but it, she's working her core because she has to control her body, right? So now if I did it with you, it'd be here, there, there, there. OK, switch spots with her. This is really advanced. OK, now what she's going to do is I'm going to hit it from behind her. She's going to have to stand up and catch it and figure out where it is. So there, so that's a get up and go. So the more we do this, each one of these times she's standing up, I'm counting it as like a squat. So she's got more and more squats. We can do hundreds of them. I want you to stand all the way up. Okay. There you go. OK, now what I want you to do is that's one part of it. The, the most uh, advanced way to do something like this would be if somebody's able to, you hit it. You throw it to me. Just hit it in the air, hit it in the air would be to stand up and catch it before it lands. The worst case scenario is you can pop it up and, and catch it. 
But it takes time and you have to work to getting to that point and it takes a lot of body control. Yeah, All right. Fun. And if you're on a stage, you really got to be careful. Did you see me almost cross that? How many of you were like, watch him fall, watch him fall? I know someone was thinking that. Probably my parents back there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they are back there, but they're not hoping I fall. That's one of the best things you can do with the balloon too. Now I'm gonna talk quickly about some stretching stuff. Stretching should be done when you are warm. Good, See, I got someone listening. And it should not hurt. It might be a little discomfort, but it should, you should back off of it when it starts to hurt. If you feel it in the tendon, you're doing too much. That means if you're doing a, a hamstring stretch, imagine I'm laying down, my leg would be here, and I'd be reaching for my toe. And if I can touch my toe without this hurting back here behind my knee, I'm doing all right. If it starts to feel a little pain behind your knee, bend your leg a little bit. You'll still get the stretch in your hamstring. Uh, here's something that you can use for if you get cramping in your, in your muscles, myofascial release. Anybody in here gets spasticity and you're cramping and, and just feel like it's, well, these are good for it, right? You have one at home? Okay, just make it sure. Um, Another thing that you can use is something that you would get from the kitchen. They're hiding stuff from me. A rolling pin. It's not just for cakes and cookies and that kind of stuff. You can use it for that or that. Tight IT bands, it's great for myofascial release. Tight calves. With the other one, you can actually do it if you have the flexibility, but the other one you can do on your back. Any questions so far? Neck. What? Your neck, if your neck always has like tightness. If you have tightness in your neck, you should talk to your doctor about what's causing the tightness in your neck or what can be done before you do something that's going to be uh, resistance. But there is stretches and stuff you can do with your neck. You can drop your shoulders. You can hold something like this and let it stretch it or... Question? Do you have a website? Yeah, it's www. You knew that part of it, didn't you? <laughs> Balancedpersonaltraining.com. Uh, this is a kettlebell. I'm not a big fan of kettlebells for beginners. What? What is that bicycle thing called? Uh, station, bicycle. Uh, bicycle thing. <laughs> It's a cycle ergometer or a station, uh, a portable bicycle. They have, I've had, you can get them at Walmart sometimes. They have them at, the Gold's Gym makes one that's just not as stable, but they have it at Walmart or Target or, or you can look on Google or, or, go, or go to eBay. I think eBay has everything. Stuff that hasn't even come out yet. Yeah, the reason that this is called a BOSU ball is because you can use both sides both sides up. So if you were gonna stand on this side, to stand, you'd go up and stand on it like this, and you can do squats on it, and, or, or whatever you want. You can do, if the adva most advanced part of that side would be doing something like a single-legged squat on it, and up, but you'd have to have really good balance for that. Also, push-ups. You can do push-ups on it. It's working your core. Push-ups are as good for your core as a plank probably better because you're in motion. All right, what am I leaving out, guys? Floor yeah, well, uh, floor exercise, I, I covered some stretching. There's overhead presses, which are basically... Nah, that's gonna get too advanced. I only got about a minute and a half. So we're gonna run a marathon now. <laughs> um, jumping if you can jump. Don't jump if you can't jump. Uh, pressing, you can use these or dumbbells. I like to keep the hips and shoulders square all the time. Helps with rotation, something like that. This would be great if my left arm was weaker than my right because this is only five pounds and this is eight pounds. Uh, and the other thing that I like doing with these, which you guys all know, you guys have all done, is slams. And I'm gonna close it on that, but if you take the ball, and I can't pick it back up because it's too far down and I don't want to slam it on the stage. Anybody in here ever been frustrated? Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
Oz going to call you all out if you said no. So if you take something like this and slam it, can you get that for me, please? All right, and you got to stand up an extra time. I'm not charging you for it. Is it heavier than you thought? Um, yeah, it was actually. Okay. Yes. Or slam it. Can I have that again? Oh. <laughs> You're moving a little more than you thought. Yeah, I am. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, a round of applause. There we go. So you can do slams. Or oh, the other thing you can do is slam from side to side. So you're rotating. Or you can do it from a seated position sitting in a ball. Um, I got all kinds of gadgets, all kinds of fun stuff up here. When it's over, you can come ask me about it. But uh, the purpose is I want as much stuff to make sure that everybody is interested in what I'm doing. And if, and if they're not, I'll come up with something else. Some people I just do manual um, resistance exercises where I would just hold someone's hand and they'd push and push and push or pull and pull or put your hands out like this. If she, if she wanted to work her core without turning, I can't see what you're doing. Just she's pushing this way against my hands. Breathe. She's pushing that way. Where do you feel it? My middle. Right here. Now push the other way so we don't walk in circles when we get off the stage. Okay. Thank you guys very much. Anybody have any questions before? No, no questions. No time. No time. No time for questions. You know, unbelievable that there's still 70 people here, which is huge for a regular program, right? That's really good. That's great for a regular program, but the place looks like a lot of people are gone. But yeah, so you all know, we had over 250 in here today. Thank you very much. Someone taking a picture. Someone taking a picture. There she is, right there. All right. Great. Thank, thank you, guys. You, Jeff. And thank these, you, volunteers. As much as I want to thank Stuart, I want to thank everybody who came because these programs don't work without you guys. He coordinates it. You come. We're all happy. And it's a good day. And before I get into finishing up today, again, remember, we can't do these programs without the help of those who are giving us the dollars. And so again, I want to just thank Genzyme, a Santa Fe company. I want to thank Mallinckrodt, Tevin Neuroscience, and Genentech. And now I'm going to ask you all to have a great day, drive carefully, and look forward to seeing you another time. Thank you.